Well, good morning and welcome back. I think many of us are coming off of a vacation and so hopefully we'll be able to click our brains into uh, our normal speed. Um, I want to start by introducing a new senior member of the city planning team. Brian Singer has returned to the city planning fold as the senior director for Land Use and Commission Affairs. So thank you, Brian. Um, and with that, Thank you, Chair Lago. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the City Planning Commission Review Session. Today is Tuesday, September 5th, 2017. The time is 1.10 and a quorum is present. Commissioners, we will begin with a presentation by the department's chief urban designer, Claudia Harasme, who will share the department's principles for good urban design in planning for the future of the city of New York. Thank you very much and good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm very happy to be here and introduce myself as the new Chief Urban Designer, um, which is to me a great privilege because I have been working here for over 14 years and really enjoy and appreciate the important work we do here. And of course, we don't, I, we don't do this alone. Uh, there's about 30 urban designers in the agency. Um, they're between central divisions and our borough offices. And a lot of them are here, if you want to stand up for a second. <laughs> okay, so back to the presentation. Um, so I'm here to talk about how we practice urban design at the department. And of course, we start with people. And what we mean by that is that we start from the human perspective, not just from the air. We go, we try to see the city as people experience it, going about their lives, uh, maybe finding places to pause, maybe finding places to come together as friends and neighbors, and maybe as concerned citizens, or maybe just, you know, on a weekend to relax and uh, take it all in. And all of these things happen in what we call our public realm. The public realm is, of course, our streets are the most, um, uh, ubiquitous uh, public realm. It's what really connects physically all of our neighborhoods and our activities. Uh, it is our plazas and parks, which we have also have been reclaiming in the last two decades, a lot of waterfront uh, for this use. And it's of course about our privately owned public spaces, which we also have in high density districts. And lately, we have also been paying a lot more attention to the spaces uh, underneath infrastructure and claiming those as important pieces of our public realm. Um, we do this, uh, urban designers, of course, in collaboration with our planners. And this is a very, um, this is something that happens every day at the department where we work and really charrette together and try to draw out options uh, with the design tools to understand what could be potential uh, solutions. We sometimes also do it through specific projects and we build models to help us communicate with a broader audience. And all of this to come up with um, uh, uh, the policies that guide our design direction. We also, all of these um, ends up in our certain regulations and sometimes we also draw or write uh, a specific place base or project based guidelines when we need that extra layer of design um, guidance for a particular place. We also do a lot of work of advocacy with our civic and community partners and to make sure that we are hearing as many voices as possible and that we all together, not just from the government, are pushing to make this city the best that it can be. So after uh, over a decade of experience here at the department, we felt the need to come up with these uh, urban design principles. And this is a way of synthesizing and encapsulating a lot of the values that are important to us and with intent not only to bring clarity to our internal conversations, but of course, and equally important to our conversations with the applicant community and the communities that we work with. As you'll see, they're very uh, intentionally high level. Uh, it's, it's a large city, very diverse, and we felt that we needed to boil them down to almost questions. Um, since these are you know, values that can play out and can manifest in very different ways, in very different contexts. 
what I'm, I'm going to illustrate these principles to you through case studies. So the first, of course, is good urban design creates or reinforces a, sen a sense of place. Uh, we're a city of neighborhoods, and we're very proud of it. And we try to really understand what are the characteristics of a particular location. In this case, this is the Bronx, which you saw recently. Uh, it was certified in two-wheeler. And we did a lot of analysis trying to really understand and um, what, what is there. And one thing that came up really quickly is like the topography and the winding roads and how that creates another type of space that is not our typical gridded um, um, pattern of the city. And so that also brings opportunities and challenges in terms of uh, site conditions and um, views and vistas. Um, this is, for example, we analyze how, where were the opportunities for growth and how that uh, matched the, the neighborhood and reinforced the sense of place. You can see it's a very uh, steep topography in some areas. And then we also then do a perspectival analysis of understanding the neighborhood and how the building envelopes and the zoning technique, you know, the zoning technical requirements would play out in a given site. Um, and then really understand what that means in terms of flexibility and how that matches the existing conditions. And then we also like to illustrate uh, what it can actually become. So that it's not just about the zoning regulations, but how that is, what kind of environment ultimately that is creating uh, for that neighborhood. Our second urban design principle is about equity, which of course, it's very important to this administration as well, um, and to urban design in general. It is really about uh, creating accessible and better connections between places. And this is from the East New York neighborhood study that was also um, passed some time ago. We're here, we work with our capital planning. This is the um, existing park. We work with our capital planning um, division to collaborate more closely with other city agencies to look at this existing asset and how we could enhance um, its, its value for the community. Looking at existing conditions and maybe things that exist that we want to celebrate and then add layers of use or delight to, to, to these corners of the city. In this case, it's a transportation hub and we wanted to add seating and comfort to make it even more accessible. We, we're also looking, as you know, East New York has a IBC zone, a bus, uh, industrial business area, and we wanted to enhance access to um, those places of work. So it's not just about enhancing our recreational opportunities, but also just how we move around the city for any use. Um, urban design plays, plays um, it's, plan and design with care and attention to detail. Um, some of our, a lot of our neighborhood studies, as I mentioned, have uh, infrastructure, overhead infrastructure, and we have been re-looking at them as places, opportunities for enhancing um, place making, if you would. Um, and these are uh, a few neighborhoods that have elevated structures. This is East Harlem, where we were looking at how do we create a sense of, a uh, better sense of place, open it up, better circulation, and probably lighting. This is in uh, Jerome Avenue as well, where we had a transportation study, not only looking at what happens under the elevator, but that, that transportation and public space balance around that area. And the High Line, which is a very high profile project that really was trying to create a, a, a beautiful regional attraction to the city, but we were also concerned about what happens at the ground floor. So it's not just about this great asset for um, the park itself, but also how do we retain the vibrancy of the ground floor underneath it. And lastly, urban design, we think, should make you feel good, <laughs> because this is what makes the city attractive to many of us. And this is a study uh, that was done about the active design guidelines and shaping the sidewalk experience, where we really analyzed the sidewalk as if it was a room, and really trying to understand what are the things that happen on every plane, and particularly <coughs> on, the, on the building plane, how, what are the zoning tools and regulations that we have that impact 
ultimately what kind of sidewalk experience we have. And this was useful for when we did CQA last year, where we, as you know, uh, created larger ground floor, the possibility of larger ground floors, either for activating it with commercial or community facility uses, or even for residential uses, where you might wanna have that extra height and create a buffer and more privacy to the ground floor units. And so I want to walk you a little bit about how we, we do that, what our process is. And first of all, we do go to the site. We understand the site in many ways. We do a lot of mapping and what we call desktop analysis, a lot of like Google Street View <laughs> uh, site visits in preparation to actual physical visits. Um, we also, and, and of course, we go and visit and measure and survey and really try to understand what are the dimensions of a place. And we do sometimes what we call mental map sketches, which is like to go back and kind of uh, draw what stick with us, what kind of uh, aspects of that place stick, stick with us. We engage, we collaborate with our communities. As you know, we do a lot of outreach. We do some visioning sometimes when we go out and uh, trying to talk more in depth about what kind of experience physically uh, we are aiming for. And, and of course, translating zoning into more <laughs> accessible language and, and making it uh, visually attractive and, and understandable. And we try to have fun <laughs> when we do that. These are some images from Summer Streets. We created this uh, game of zones where we had like actual models that people could wear and understand the different districts and you know, kind of understand the, the, what it means that are going from a single family home to a R10 building. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and of course, we, we think about, we think across scales because any policy that is a citywide policy would have very specific uh, ways of landing in a particular location uh, as the uh, for, um, housing plan uh, or even our uh, industrial and, and jobs plan. We also, um, challenge ourselves to think long and short term. Um, and we, we did that uh, in relation to flood uh, risk. We did a lot of analysis and really understanding what would be the impact of flood in our building stock and thinking about it in terms of how it affects now, but also throwing out many scenarios of what could be that impact, even at a neighborhood scale, uh, depending on the things that we do. We've also done a lot of work in uh, visualizing and explaining to people what tools, what kind of uh, things they can do to their buildings at the building scale to adapt to flood risk. And last but not least, we do, as designers, uh, we question the status quo. Um, and we ask ourselves, you know, what could be the different scenarios? We do a lot of scenario playing. So for example, in the Cherry then, this is in the South Bronx, we were looking at uh, how the, how these, what were all the options for this area and what could an urban freeway look like in this day and age? And so we went out and actually ended up not necessarily designing the project itself, but the process of how do we build consensus, how do we build an understanding that represented a lot of, of, of uh, stakeholders to actually have this have support for mm -hmm. one solution. And we pull all of these voices together and it you know not only potentially changes this corner of New York, but it might actually bring change also to uh, other freeways, urban freeways around the state. And so we have been sharing our urban design principles um, with many stakeholders. We, um, of course, as I mentioned internally, it's something that we have had sessions and you actually have also a little pamphlet with you um, with the summary of these principles. And we had an event at the AIA with practitioners. We have also expanding our network, so to speak, into interagency. Uh, what we call the Interagency Urban Design Network, so that we and DOT, HPD, EDC, DDC, all of us can start to build more of a common language and um, make sure that all of our design values are taken into uh, consideration. 
So thank you very much. see why our urban design team is just such a secret weapon that we have at city planning. <laughs> Any questions for Claudia from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Cirillo. Thank you so much for that. I, I understand how sort of intimately connected zoning and urban design, particularly in the public realm, um, how they fit together. And But I wondered if, are you is the division at all called upon, and I know you talk about sort of interagency mm -hmm. relationships, which obviously are critical, but beyond sort of rezoning and building new communities, much of the urban experience is using pre-existing space, right, mm -hmm. and trying to rethink it. And, um, so I just wonder, in that respect, are you called upon to contribute your experience and knowledge um, from an urban design point of view mm -hmm. with the kinds of improvements that are being made more regularly outside of the rezoning process, although as we look to the future, dare I <laughs> use the expression in Greater East Midtown, I'm not sure I'm not allowed to say Greater East Midtown, but <laughs> um, but as that as we look ahead to in, in increased public realm improvements, um, but many very often they're got, they're driven by DOT mm -hmm. um, and not you know it's it's sort of meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered where you fit into that mm -hmm. process uh, for communities now, mm -hmm. um, if at all, because I think there's a absolute important contribution from a design point of view that you could be bringing. Mm -hmm. um, and also given your understanding of, and this department's understanding of sort of environmental reviews and impacts beyond making a beautiful block, but that have other impacts that we're always looking at when we talk about rezonings and development. How does that all fit, if at all? And if it doesn't, it definitely should be something that the department tries to squeeze a seat at the table on as, as mm -hmm. we move ahead. It's definitely something we do. Uh, we have really good relationships with our uh, sister agencies, specifically um, DOT, because mm -hmm. we do work a lot um, for actual projects that then has built that sort of uh, relationship. And so, um, we have different agencies that call upon our services, if you would, for advisory role. Um, so it can be from when they developed their uh, street design manual, we were part of that task force that was reviewing it so that mm -hmm. we were also giving input from our perspective and the work that we do. Right. Um, and so that it's ingrained into their um, uh, manual. We also work, um, we, we do, uh, site review and, and um, advisory review to HPD, to NYCHA, um, and other agencies as well, and, okay, and of right. course with EDC. So sometimes we have one meeting, <coughs> that's it, and sometimes we have a series of meetings. Um, it really depends, um, sure. and, but we, we certainly like, and this is part of why the interagency network kind of came about. It was sort of, let's all get together we're all designers, let's visualize it. For a long time, we were the only urban design team in a lot of these agencies. Um, and actually, these agencies now have urban designers or more urban designers in the staff because they understand the value of that and, and we're trying to foster that uh, interconnectedness. Excellent. Thank you so much, thank sure. you. Commissioner Rafan. Thank you, it's a really exciting presentation and for those of us who think we know how you work, it's great to actually understand how it's done and I imagine for the um, New York citizen not connected with city planning in any way, it's a really great opportunity to understand government and how it's working for him or her specifically. But towards that end, is there a mechanism to get feedback from the public? Um, we are the only agency that holds public hearings on a regular basis. And is there a way for people to communicate outside of the hearing process with your uh, team about um, suggestions they may have from the public realm? Hmm. We don't have a formal process, I would say, um, but you know, our board offices are our ears and eyes out in our communities, and 
sometimes we do get feedback that way that um, it's more of things that come through the borough offices and uh, might make us think about a, spe a specific circumstance or condition. Um, no suggestion, Batsa. Yeah. <laughs> <don't want> <laughs> <laughs> I would say that one thing that we are trying to do um, is it's, it's thinking about how do we um, make ourselves more accessible, whether it's through social media and Instagram and sort of communicating these values where the public can just opine and, and give us more feedback. I'd note two things. One, the placement of urban designers in the borough offices rather than just as headquarters, so to be closer. The second is that if there is a Green Day event, um, if there is a Summer Streets event, the urban design team is out there. One of the fun things that they did, I think it was as part of Earth Day, is they had a rendering of um, the canyons of Broadway in Lower Manhattan and asked people to envision it in the future. And they had all colored markers. And if people came up and said that they didn't know how to draw, they would describe their vision and the urban designers would sketch it out. And so it is a way of taking it to the streets in a very positive way. I have one suggestion on that front. Um, the Museum of the City of New York now has the design lab. And there may be a way to get this information there for future design planners. That's a great idea. It's mostly designed for kids. Yep. Commissioner Ortiz? It's a very um, important and um, I would say I don't have a, a particular answer right now. It's something that we're actually looking into and starting to research because we know that the nature of retail is changing and we don't, you know, we're trying to uh, understand what that really means for the physical environment um, and what those uses could be. I think that, um, Again, zoning is a very blunt tool, and we can, you know, sometimes we do get very specific in certain areas, um, which is not something that we do everywhere. So um, it is something that we were learning about and really trying to finesse our approach to it because there are environments that we want to create, say, and, and, and set this framework for something to happen, even if it takes the market a little time to get there. Uh, but once you make them, um, you know, residential uses in particular, it's really hard to, to do anything else with that space. So, so that is a question that we're, we're learning a lot more about and, and figuring out when it's appropriate to mandate versus just allow and, and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, Commissioner Delos. <coughs> Claudia, thank you. Um, just going to the interagency collaboration piece, and I'm, you know, in particular, looking at the spaces underneath um, subway trellises and things like that. And wanted to ask, um, you know, outside of let's say East Midtown, where there's strong collaboration with MTA. 
how, how is the relationship with the MTA on a broader scale? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I think about 4th Avenue and 9th Street and, you know, 14 years after rezoning and nothing still happened at that site, for instance. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, what is the process there and what more can we do? Uh, I think <laughs> that might be larger than just urban designs issues. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I think there's two, two answers to that. One is that I think the answer is still more in the what is to do uh, bucket. It's much larger than uh, there's a lot more opportunities and things that we could be doing. Um, on the other hand, I think that as urban designers, part of what we think it's really important is for people to visualize and get excited and understand the, the potential of a place, not just what they have in front of their eyes. And so, in a way, we hope that this informs the community and makes them also advocates and, and more outspoken advocates about what kind of neighborhoods they want to see. Uh, because as much as we at City Planning do a little bit of everything and we, we don't have control of everything and, and zoning cannot resolve all of that. So, so this is where these collaborations are important, but I wouldn't say that we have a super strong collaboration with MTA. It's, it's more like particular projects than or localities um, where we find common ground um, and but not a general buy-in, let's say. I'll note that this presentation is a teaser because at a review session coming up this fall, Claudia and her team will come back to give us some ideas about what might be done in collaboration with DCAS um, and ACS and DTFA in order to enliven the daycare and senior centers while recognizing that it's not something that we can require under our purview, but we certainly can encourage it. So thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hey, so the first item on the agenda for certification is a proposed zoning map and zoning text amendments in Community District 1, the Astoria neighborhood in Queens. Our presenter will be Debbie Carney, Deputy Director of the Queens Office. And I'll note that in the, pa the last presentation by Claudia, um, we had the term delight and feeling good, and I hope that that <laughs> pervades throughout the review session. Good afternoon, commissioners. The applicant, um, Astoria Boulevard LLC, intends to construct a seven-story mixed-use building in Astoria, Queens, Community District 1, on property uh, that is currently in an R6B district. Uh, it's shown here a two-story building. It's a commercial building that houses a uh, dance studio and a martial arts studio. You can see in the lower right-hand side, this is an irregular uh, property. It's approximately 9,036 uh, square feet. And it's located um, on Astoria Boulevard South between 35th and 36th Streets. It's shown here on the area map outlined in red. The rezoning area or the project area extends beyond the applicant's property and it's shown by the dotted line uh, which um, covers the uh, block front properties at a depth of 100 feet. The other properties within the rezoning area are for the most part two and three story buildings they are mixed-use buildings, mixed-use commercial and residential buildings, or residential buildings uh, with heights ranging from two, story, two stories to six, well, actually, primarily two and three stories. There is one six-story building just adjacent uh, to the applicant's property, which is a six-story building. And uh, that is in place due to a BSA, the uh, uh, Dested uh, case, in which this property owner was able to vest um, under the previous R6. Other properties along uh, Astoria Boulevard South are also a mix of commercial and residential public facility um, properties, retail, um, with, uh, within buildings ranging from two to seven stories. This entire area was rezoned as part of the Astoria rezoning in 2010 
where the department uh, rezoned the applicant's property from R6 to R6B and properties along Astoria Boulevard to the west of the site were zoned C43. I think it's shown more clearly on the next map. You can see here the applicant's block within the R6B district uh, and the adjacent C43 district to the west. The R6B district is a general residence district. It limits FAR to a maximum of two. Um, it uh, permits residential and commercial uses, but it limits also the heights of buildings to 50 feet. The C43 district, on the other hand, um, permits a wide range of commercial, community facility, and residential uses at medium densities. Uh, for residential uses, there's a maximum permitted FAR of 3.6, for commercial uses, 3.4, and for community facilities, 4.8. The R6B will not accommodate the applicant's proposal, which is for a 72-foot high building at an FAR of 3.49. The adjacent C43 district, however, uh, will uh, facilitate that development. So the applicant is proposing to extend, extend that adjacent C43 district to cover the block front uh, between 35th and 36th streets. The applicant is also proposing a zoning text amendment uh, that will designate this uh, project area as an MIH designated area. Uh, they are opting for option two, which would require 30% of the residential units be affordable at 80% AMI. So the project will result in 35, a total of 35 residential units, 11 of which will be permanently affordable at 80% AMI. Uh, this is a site plan showing the project. Um, the footprint extends the uh, lot line to lot line on the applicant's site. It also shows two curb cuts, 13-foot curb cuts, uh, that will lead to parking at the cellar level, the 13 parking spaces, and also uh, parking in the rear for an additional five spaces. Uh, this uh, drawing is axonometric. Uh, sh simply shows the height of the building. The proposed height is 72 feet. The proposed base height is set at 62. And the same is shown here in this illustrative 72-foot um, height and a 62-foot base height. Are there questions? Questions from the commission? Commissioner Arthur. Thank you. Um, since this was rezoned in 2010, goes right to that block. Is there any background you want to share with us as to why it wasn't included? Well, the properties west of that were historically, they historically had commercial overlays on them. I'm not sure why this particular block front was excluded from the C43. Um, the heights are very, very similar to the heights to the west. Um, uh, pretty much low density. Um, but it, well, you know, in answer to your question, no, I'm not quite sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Delos. Um, two, two questions. One is, if you happen to know what the AMI is in that community board yeah. now, today, um, and that can obviously come back to us. And then the other is, I guess, since the, only 11 of the units, at 30% of the total square footage equals 11 units, I guess that means that the MIH units are actually slightly larger than the market rate units. That would be helpful to have a breakdown of the units when that comes back. Can we, we can provide yeah. that for you when we come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, this application is certified. Thank you. Item number two, page 17, for referral is a zoning text amendment. Our presenter is Kiyoshi Yamazaki from the Department Zoning Division. <laughs>
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Um, the department, this presentation will be very short uh, because much of our presentation has been done by Debbie just a, uh, like a second ago. So the Department of City Planning uh, proposes uh, to uh, establish an R61 non-contextual residence district for MIH areas that would have the same bulk regulations regardless of site uh, location on a wide or narrow street. This uh, proposal would create an option at R6 densities similar to what exists for non-contextual R8 and R9 districts and being created for R7 districts through um, ongoing actions. The new R61 district would also uh, become the residential equivalent for future C42 and C43 districts in MIH areas. In all other ways, R61 would follow the regulations of an R6 district. Uh, 3510 Astoria Boulevard South, South application that was just presented to the commission would be the first um, area that will be subject to the proposed regulations. Some of the issues uh, why we are proposing this text change. Um, in most zoning districts applicable, in most zoning districts applicable in MIH areas, oh, I forgot to flip the <laughs> slides. Yes, it's, it's the downside of having a copy in front of me. So, um, in most uh, zoning districts applicable in MIH areas, um, there is no distinction in the maximum FAR and log coverage depending on adjacent street widths. However, uh, non contextual R6 and R7 districts each have a single building envelope, but their FAR and in R6 districts, log coverage currently depend on street width. This can make it difficult to determine the permitted FAR for a site and make site planning more challenging. This is being addressed in R71 and R72 districts by ongoing land use actions that proposes, propose a single FAR of 4.6. Downtown Far Rockaway Development Plan and Lower Concourse North Rezoning are pursuing this uh, tax change and both of them are uh, already approved by the City Planning Commission and the currently under review by the uh, City Council. In addition, in uh, Westchester, Westchester Mused uh, Rezoning, City Council approved a consistent FAR and log coverages for that specific R6 district, but um, it expressed a desire for an R6 option that kept the existing distinction uh, between a wide and narrow district, wide and narrow street. So this is the last slide uh, uh, for my presentation. Uh, the, um, the table to the right shows the comparison between the um, existing R6 district and our proposed R61 district. R61 would have the same FAR and lock coverage in wide and narrow streets. Existing R6 district would maintain the existing distinction. So as you can see, the only difference is the narrow street portion that will have 65% uh, on the R61 district and 3.6 uh, uh, FAR for the uh, proposed district. In all other ways, R61 would follow the uh, regulations for an R6 district, including use, parking, and height and setback re regulations. This is the end of my presentation. So questions from the commissioners. Commissioner Delos. So the proposal is to do this in Astoria, mm -hmm. but there are obviously non-contextual R6 districts throughout the city. No, there is no retroactive applica applicability of the proposed tax. This um, uh, R61, well, first of all, R61 doesn't exist today. Right. And uh, it will exist only as part of uh, rezoning actions, which will be um, uh, uh, reviewed by the commission and the city council. Okay. This was a situation that arose in a number of the rezonings, and we saw the need to have this additional flexibility to have this new zoning district um, so that we don't just go creating it on a case-by-case -case basis, but rather now um, have a name for it, R61. Yes, Commissioner Marim.
On White Street, yes. Yes, this is exactly the same provisions approved for the um, Westchester Muse um, application uh, that was approved in early earlier this year. And would, would the artist want to apply only for those for MIH Yes, so um, yes, this, this will be applied only when M R61 is mapped with um, um, MIH. Yes, it, uh, for non-MIH development, the regular R6 uh, regulations apply, including lower FAR to um, uh, height and setback, et cetera. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, Commissioner Akpan. So if, in fact, it's only changing or potentially changing on the narrow streets mm -hmm. and we no longer have the contextual condition, well, isn't that bit of a risk that, I'm just, can you explain the contextual difference? And sure, yes. Um, R6 district, as it exists today, is a non-contextual okay. district. Thank you. That's yes. what I was mm -hmm. about. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> sure. And again, this is just part of growing with MIH and realizing what new tools it is that we need. And so, other questions? then this will be referred to the community board and the borough president for 60 days. Okay, let's uh, move on. Yeah. City, is it just to the Queens? Queens. The Queens. Yes, this yeah. is yeah. a location specific. Uh, because this yes. arose out of the prior application that we just certified. So let's move on to item number three, page 23 for certification, special permits and authorizations to facilitate development of mixed use buildings in the special South Richmond District of Staten Island. Our presenter is Alina Farishta from the Staten Island office. We're on item number three, page 23. Hello, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, the Riverside Gallery of Proposal seeks to facilitate a development which includes a regional retail center with waterfront public access along the Arthur Kill Waterway in the Richmond Valley neighborhood in the Special South Richmond Development District of Community District 3 in Staten Island. According to the applicant, this proposal aims to balance the applicant's retail needs and the goals for preservation of unique natural features of the site and provide waterfront public access. The proposed development site contains a total of 32.89 acres of lot area and is located along Arthur Kill Road, which is a major thoroughfare providing north to south access from Richmond Town to Tottenville. It is bounded by Arthur Kill Waterway to the west, it's south of the Outer Bridge Crossing, which provides access to New Jersey, and it's north of Richmond Valley Road. This area has seen new commercial development projects in the past 10 years several of which which have come through the City Planning Commission for approvals. As noted in this aerial, DPR Parkland and DEP Blue Belt properties are located within the surrounding area. Blue Belt properties and other undeveloped privately owned parcels contain wetlands under the jurisdiction of New York State DEC and the U.S. Army Corps. These jurisdictional areas trigger further review by their respective agencies, including the more detailed delineation of the present boundaries of the wetlands by DEC and their respective adjacent areas. The site is served with public transit options such as the Arthur Kill Staten Island Railway Station located a quarter mile south of the property, and it is also served by the S78 MTA bus service, which runs along Arthur Kill Road and provides service to the Staten Island Railway Station and the St. George Ferry Terminal. The surrounding land uses consist of mostly commercial and light industrial uses within the M11 and M31 zoning districts. A majority of the development site is within the M11 district, however, approximately two acres is mapped south of Richmond Valley Road within the M31 district. Properties within the surrounding area fronting the western side of Arthur Kill Road include a veterinary hospital, medical imaging facility, and a beverage warehouse and distribution facility. Across the street, fronting the eastern side of Arthur Kill Road are several shopping centers and two existing single-family homes. The remainder of the parcels along the west shore are largely undeveloped. 
The waterfront zoning lot has an irregular shape due to parcels located along portions of the eastern boundary that are owned and controlled by a separate entity. The remainder of the eastern lot boundary abuts Arthur Kill Road at two separate locations. The property also has frontage of approximately 1,500 linear feet of shoreline along the Arthur Kill Waterway and in addition, 500 linear feet along Mill Creek located along the southern boundary of the property. The southern boundary also has frontage along the unimproved right of way of Richmond Valley Road. The site contains DEC tidal regulated wetlands in adjacent areas and US Army Corps freshwater wetlands. The remainder of this site is heavily wooded. The top left image shows the coal house, which is the only existing building on the site, and it is proposed to remain and be repurposed for office and commercial uses as part of this proposal. The coal house was built in the 1800s, and the former owners were among the early settling families of Staten Island. This site has historical significance to Staten Island's history, although it is not a designated landmark. The top right image shows the intersection of Arthur Kill Road and Richmond Valley Road facing northbound. And the bottom left image shows the intersection of Arthur Kill Road and the unbuilt portion of Richmond Valley Road facing west, which is proposed to be improved by the applicant to provide access to the site. And the bottom right image shows the current state of the Arthur Kill waterfront facing um, northbound towards the Outer Bridge Crossing. The proposal for Riverside Galleria would facilitate a 589,619 gross square feet of waterfront retail on the south shore of Staten Island, which would include a movie theater, restaurants, supermarket, general retail, and a waterfront public access area. The proposal also includes improvement of the unbuilt Richmond Valley Road and would develop internal private driveways to provide vehicular and pedestrian access throughout the site. This proposal would require a grant of two special permits to permit no limitation of floor area for the proposed retail establishments and bulk modifications to permit building heights greater than 30 feet and obstructions within the waterfront yard. Additionally, the proposal would require a grant of several authorizations to modify design requirements for the waterfront public access areas due to the presence of DEC regulated wetlands on the site. In addition, there would be authorizations um, for South Richmond Development District regulations to modify topography and removal of trees of greater than six inch in caliber. As a as earlier, the site is bounded by Arthur Kill Road along the eastern boundary. Proposed improvements to Arthur Kill Road include intersection widenings at Richmond Valley Road and the proposed northern drive labeled Outer Drive, in addition to sidewalk improvements along the property's frontage. This image is a rendering of the proposed improvement of Richmond Valley Road facing west. The proposed improvement of Richmond Valley Road would not include portions within the DEC regulated tidal wetland adjacent areas or within the DEP owned parcel located along the southern portion of this property. Access to the site would also be provided from a northern signalized access point um, which is proposed at the intersection of Arthur Kill Road and the new two-way private driveway to be known as Outer Drive, which would run east to west between Arthur Kill Road and the waterfront. An additional two-lane entrance only access point would be provided north of the Cole House. The applicant also proposes an internal private driveway to be known as River Drive, which would be connecting the northern and southern entries from Arthur Kill Road. River Drive is proposed as the applicant's main retail drive, which is designed for the shopping center, with two stories of retail fronting both sides of this private drive, pedestrian plazas, and access to the public waterfront promenade. It is, it is designed to balance pedestrian vehicular access through the retail center and public waterfront. As depicted in this image, the green shading um, on top of these buildings picked where green roofs are proposed. A total of 4.5 acres of green roofs are proposed to manage stormwater on the site. The northern portion of the site below the outer bridge 
um, contain wooded areas which would be pursued which would be preserved and improved by creating 2.9 acres of fresh water wetland area. Tidal wetland restoration enhancements are proposed along the western shoreline of the Arthur Hill and the southern shoreline of Mill Creek. Preliminary discussions have taken place um, between the applicant and New York State DEC and Army Corps regarding the proposed development and the proposed design and impervious coverage within the tidal adjacent areas is subject to DEC approval. The applicant is seeking authorizations from the commission to modify the waterfront public access area design requirements in order to accommodate DEC's guidelines for development, which I'll discuss in depth later. There are a total of nine buildings, each with two floors, which would constitute the proposed retail center, and this includes the existing coal house along Arthur Hill Road. The proposed development includes 300,000 and 128 square feet of general retail uses, approximately 53,000 square feet of restaurants, 80,000 square feet for a supermarket, 55,000 square feet for a cinema, 1,500 square feet for office space, and 4,800 square feet for mechanical and operational uses. In between these buildings, elevated walkways are provided for access to and from the second floor of these retail buildings and to the waterfront public access area. The proposal would require a special permit to authorize certain commercial spaces to be larger than 10,000 square feet. The, these proposed uses would also require approximately 1,721 parking spaces, which are proposed to be provided within three levels of a structured garage, mostly below grade. The provision of 30 or more parking spaces in South Richmond require the applicant to seek an authorization from the commission. In addition, for developments on waterfront lots, the maximum height for commercial uses in an M11 district is 30 feet. Exceeding this height requires a special permit. Of the nine proposed buildings, seven buildings would exceed a height of 30 feet. Six buildings are proposed to have a height of 57 feet, and one building is proposed to have a height of 96 feet, which includes the cinema and supermarket uses. The applicant is providing a total of 184,327 square feet of publicly accessible area on the site. A portion of this area is provided per the waterfront zoning text and regulations, which are highlighted in blue. Um, however, the remainder of the 91,000 square feet of public access area, which are outlined in red and highlighted in gray in this image, were provided voluntarily by the applicant. The voluntary public access area includes the elevated walkways which provide access between the second level of retail buildings and connect above River Drive to the proposed buildings located west of River Drive and to the waterfront public access area. Since this development site is a waterfront zoning lot, um, it must provide a waterfront public access area, which consists of a shore public walkway, upland connections, and supplemental waterfront public access area. As noted earlier, due to the existence of DEC regulated tidal wetlands in adjacent area, the applicant has requested modifications to the waterfront public access area design requirements. In total, the applicant would be providing 92,800 square feet of waterfront public access area with the goals of preserving and enhancing the tidal wetlands present on the site, as well as maximizing open space along the shoreline. According to waterfront zoning requirements, visual corridors are required at the extent of Richmond Valley Road and Outer Drive. Visual corridors are required to also remain unobstructed by buildings or other structures. The applicant is proposing visual corridors to be mapped along both of these Richmond Valley Road and Outer Drive. However, the applicant is seeking an authorization to waive the visual corridor requirements solely in order to provide an additional elevated pedestrian walkway and overlook, which, um, which extends 18 feet above um, outer drive. 
This area is deemed highly sensitive by DEC and therefore the public would not otherwise have access to the area north of this outer drive. In addition, the requirement for a shore public walkway is a minimum of 40 feet in width. All buildings are set back from the water by at least 40 feet. All of the waterfront here is comprised of DEC regulated wetlands and adjacent area. For this reason, a short public walkway of a minimum 40 feet is not proposed since it would involve disturbance to the wetland with provisions of, with provisions of pervious seating and other amenities typical of the shore public walkway requirements. While an open waterfront area of greater than 40 feet is being provided, the shore public walkway component is proposed at a minimum of 12 feet at its narrowest width, and it would be elevated off the ground plane along the length of the shoreline and would be supported with low impact piers for a total area of 26,142 square feet. This design requires the applicant to seek a special permit to obstruct the waterfront yard and authorizations to modify the design requirements. In addition, the shore public walkway is, is accessed by type two upland connections along outer drive, which are pedestrian walkways on each side of the roadbed for a total area of 50,725 square feet. The department has requested that the applicant record an easement along Outer Drive in order to ensure that a future development on adjacent properties may gain access from it. These connections, the upland connections, merge with the public access area located along the western side of River Drive and Richmond Valley Road. The width of these upland connections do not meet the 13 feet minimum in some areas. Um, due to this, it's a, at a minimum provided of five feet along the northern side of Outer Drive due to the sensitive wetland um, wetlands located north of it. Um, and on the southern end of Outer Drive, it has a narrowest width of about 12 feet. Um, and this is due also to the wetland adjacent areas. And in order to provide two lanes of drive um, for outer drive and the adjacent um, parcels that are not owned by the applicant. Um, in addition, the waterfront public access area contains a total of 15,993 square feet of supplemental public access area, which is located adjacent to the shore public walkway and upland connections. This includes a publicly accessible beach and a five foot wide boardwalk, which would be accessed by pedestrians from the shore public walkway. Um, this image shows the proposed waterfront public access areas, including the beach and the boardwalk. A barrier fence is proposed to prohibit access to the sensitive DEC tidal wetland areas located to the rear um, of the beach and the boardwalk. An EIS was conducted with Department of City Planning acting on behalf of the City Planning Commission as a lead agency. The notice of completion for the DEIS was issued on September 1st, 2017. The DEIS identifies significant adverse impacts related to historic and cultural resources um, related to archeology span and transportation as it relates to traffic. Possible mitigation measures are identified in the DEIS and will be further explored in the final um, environmental impact statement. The proposed project would result in unmitigated significant adverse traffic impacts. In summary, to reiterate, to reiterate, to reiterate the actions needed to facilitate the Riverside Gallery proposal, um, which includes 589,619 gross square feet of waterfront retail. Um, it would also provide the largest privately owned public waterfront access area on the south shore of Staten Island. Um, the applicant is seeking a grant of two special permits for no limitation of floor area for the proposed retail establishments and bulk modifications to the waterfront yard. Um, additionally, the proposal would require a grant of several authorizations to modify design requirements for the waterfront public access area. Thank you. Please let me know if you have questions. So this is a complex project that the team has been working with the applicant over a number of years. 
Um, the one thing that I might note about this project is that it comes at the intersection of DEC requirements and our waterfront public access requirements. When we think about our waterfront public access requirements, it's usually in the context of a hard wall and then having a 40-foot area that is landscaped and has benches. Here, none of the buildings come within 40 feet of the shorefront, but the shorefront is comprised of DEC protected wetlands. And so what this tries to do is provide access to enjoy the waterfront, but in a manner that dis, um, has a minimal amount of disturbance of the wetlands, hence the raised boardwalk rather than landscaped areas at ground level. And so I think that that is part of the number of different authorizations um, that are needed is in trying to meld a DEC protection regime with our waterfront public access. And with that, I'll turn it, I'll open it up to the commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Besser. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just curious about where we're at as far as the traffic mitigations or have there been any um, discussions? Uh, I know that the applicants had agreed to working with the street widening on the side of the street that's uh, in front of the you know, property, but what about the other side of Arthur? Uh, thank you, that's a good question. And just to reiterate for everyone else, yes, the applicant is proposing improvements to the portion of their property that abuts Arthur Clare Road. And in addition, I believe they are working with adjacent property owners to address um, widening on portions of the property that they do not own. Commissioner Cerullo. Just thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it's a huge project. Um, let me just ask a couple of, of quick questions. It's hard to tell on sort of the, the renderings. The print is very small, even mm -hmm. with these. But um, I guess, where is the garage? Yes. So actually, the, um, I have an image um, of the garage underneath. I'm just trying to figure yeah. out the, the so there's, the, there's it's all underneath. Is, oh, it's all under everything. Yeah, so there's three okay. levels of parking garage. Approximately, approximately 1,600 spaces would be located below. So the entire um, development, the nine buildings, or the seven buildings, are actually proposed on top of the parking garage. Um, and I'm just going to point to River Drive. will have a few unenclosed parking spaces. So you can do parallel parking along that River okay. Drive, but I, most of I wanted of to it, ask that because that's... Yeah. It, some of the the street um, uh, photos renderings look like there either are, there's no curb line parking, and then in others it looks like it could be. So it's not clear if it's drop off and pick up, or it's going to function like an airport, mm -hmm. you know, where people could come through, but it wouldn't be parked. So there there is an opportunity for on street parking. Correct. There's about 50 parallel parking spaces. Sorry. And that we're all having. There are about 50 to 53 parking spaces along River Drive, um, but the majority of the parking spaces would be provided in the parking garage. And entrances to that garage are located off of both the Richmond Valley Road and Outer Drive, and also off of Arthur Clare Road next to the Coal House. Okay, and, and do you drive into, is this, again, because I, I couldn't identify where the garage was. Yes. Do you drive directly from the street into the garage, or is there a road, are you using the roadway to get to the entrance and coming up from the garage the same in reverse, mm -hmm. or are you just coming, making a turn off either Richmond Valley or yeah, Hill so, into a garage? Yeah, so I can explain it here. Um, so there's this entrance right here next to the coal house, which goes, um, the right turn only lanes that go directly into the garage. Okay. Um, if you're coming up, um, you know, southbound on Arthur Clare Road and you want to turn into the development, there is an entry point up here mm -hmm. and also um, along um, Richmond Valley Road coming up, there's a separate entrance that goes into the garage. Okay, and so, and so once you're in the garage, given the size of the site and the different options, the retail options that are being made available, with this development, where are the people coming out from underground? Are, is, are there multiple uh, points mm -hmm. 
of reaching different corners of the site, or is everyone coming up pretty much in the same location? Um, that's a good question, and I can ask further details about um, like the access of it once you park your garage. Um, but to my knowledge that you would be coming back out from the garage at those locations. Um, there, um, and then in addition, a long outer drive that's just like, you know, you can come up the drive and, and you can leave it as well. So it's, it is two way along um, this outer drive and, and coming out. So you can just do the loop if you want to drop off as well. Sure, I guess I'm just trying to envision Given when, when you look at the renderings, mm -hmm. there's a, you know a great deal of the retail is is let's say in the waterfront portion. Mm -hmm. If you're parking back here, that's it's it's a trip. And I just wondered, is everyone coming out at the Arthur Kill Road end and then having to walk somehow through the entire development, or can you come up closer to where you may want to be? I, I um, so the developer uh, is or the refs are here in okay. the audience, and um, I understand that there are going to be multiple elevators throughout the parking garage that will let you Good. off at multiple. Good. I mean, I realize this is a certification, but these are some of the initial you know, yeah. thoughts and questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Arfad. Thank you. It sounds like a lot of hard work was done to get to this point, and recognizing a lot will come out during um, the public review process, such as whether or not the parking is free, given that it's supposed to be public access. Um, I, I just wanted to note that um, all the renderings, with the exception of one interior rendering, which just has the word signage, um, particularly the waterfront public access one, which is, I think, your last slide, mm -hmm. has absolutely no signage. And just knowing the nature of retail, I'm wondering if that's really how it's going to be, because I do think the experience of the waterfront access is considerably different, whether there is a lot of signage mm -hmm. or if in fact like this, which is a really lovely nature preserve, really, the way it is. But given the nature of what the development is, I'm, I would want to see going forward um, how it's really the, the going to, to be reflected. How it's going to yeah. uh, be experienced by people um, uh, participating in its waterfront public access. Thank you. Um, that's noted, and I'll let the applicants know to um, adjust some of these renderings to be more realistic um, because they will be complying with all the public signage requirements. <coughs> Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Hi. Um, so, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, if you're thinking, uh, this is about parking. Uh, so we have seen now uh, two staff members try to come before us for a discussion for reduction in parking uh, at the rally. And uh, at 50% of the staff members
Sure, thank you. Thank you for your questions. And um, I'll follow up with the commission on the parking utilization rates, um, further details about that in relation to the site. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, making sure that the construction is resilient, um, based on our knowledge, um, the buildings would be constructed above the place base flood elevation and the way that the parking garage is created um, it would it could be floodable if, if needed um, if there was a storm surge or flooding event but um, I I believe I can follow up further on d the design details um, because I know the applicant has considered that um, since it is in the flood zone um, we can follow up with those details as well um, flood zone V Have it in mind. Yeah, I think uh, I think probably just along the shoreline. It's in the hundred year, um, but I'll follow up with the exact um, the exact flood zone and the requirements. Um, I'm not aware since the site is currently undeveloped and it's mostly trees and wetlands, so um, I don't know what the state was at at, at Sandy, but um, we can follow up with that. Commissioner Kellos. I wanted to ask a couple questions. One was about the, um, the VAS identifying the historic and cultural resources. Uh, what, what impact is that? Um, is that related to the historic home? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so it was due to occupancy by Native Americans before the time of European settlement in the 17th century, and also the use of the project site for industrial purposes. Okay, so I guess we'll hear more prior to the FEIS what might be done related to that. Correct. And, and if I might, I, one thing I would maybe ask when this comes back, similar to um, some other requests, you know, given the number of um, authorizations and special permits, it would be helpful, I think, some of them could be visualized uh, on, the, on the site plan, um, you know, given the fact that a lot of them are visual corridors or change mm -hmm. in dimensions to public access. That would be helpful to, to sure. see as part of the presentation. Um, and then I wanted to clarify, did you say there's, there's a picture with, of a boat um, in one of the photos. Are, are, will there be access to that beach? Um, so, so this area right here, I'm just going to try to. Thank you. Um, so this is the beach area, um, but it will be fenced off. So you wouldn't be able to directly access the shoreline because of the wetlands. So maybe the drawing, there's a small boat. Maybe the boat should be removed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, Hi, thank you. Going back to the uh, above ground parking on, on River Drive mm -hmm. on Main Street, I'm looking at the rendering and it appears it's uh, two ways and four lanes. And it, is that where the parallel parking is going to be next to the stores? What? Yes, it's, it's actually going to be, um, I believe, one way each way and um, along the southern end of the drive there would be parking. So the parking is not going to be in front of the store? It would. It, Is that going to create an unsafe condition for dropping off passengers while people are parallel parking, stopping traffic? Um, I believe there will be crosswalks also um, permitted, like w uh, along the outer drive. So there should be um, safe areas for pedestrians to walk across. Thanks. Commissioner Besser. Thank you. Can we receive copies of the correspondence? Yes, I'll, um, I'll follow up with the applicant to provide that information to you. Okay, and also, if I may, um, I know that the property is currently vacant, with the exception of the, the one residence that's also vacant, but is this property currently being used at all? I mean, whether it be from community members, or I noticed in the paperwork it mentioned trails, so I just mm -hmm. wanted to know if it was actually 
being used at all? Um, to, to our current knowledge and the applicant's knowledge as well, um, it's not being used, um, the site's not accessible elsewhere at the moment. Um, it's just completely wooded areas with, with the wetlands and trees, except for the coal house on the front of Arthur Road. Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Marie. a berm or, okay. Um, thank you. Um, that is something that I'll have to follow up with you. Um, getting, I'll have to get more details about that specific design from the applicant. Commissioner De La Rosa. Yes, I might, I must, am I right to assume that the public access ways will be accessible at all times? It'd be helpful to know what the plan is for public the timing of public access. Right. So I know that um, our waterfront zoning requires specific timing, and um, we are working on the restrictive declaration that would tie the property owner to the timing and, and the access. So we can follow up with the specific hours as that restrictive declaration gets finalized. Other questions, Commissioner Cirillo. That question just prompted a, a, just a question. Could you just clarify are the streets that are being built are they public streets or will they be private streets or um yes yeah, so the richmond valley road um up here this is this is a, a final map street this will be okay. publicly accessible but these are the internal private driveways got it so we could assume from sort of the operations of maintaining the street rich the richmond valley road built street will be the city's responsibility and the private roads will be the responsibility of the owner. Of the Correct. owner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, one Are of the ones? renderings. I'm sorry, excuse me. I just wanted to mm -hmm. clarify. I'm not sure if the, the applicant owns the bed of Richmond Valley Road, oh. even though it is a map street. Got it. So I think we. That is a good assumption, but I think we should probably on record just say we would have to double check what the relationship is going to be with DOT in terms of uh, maintenance. Uh, understood. Thank you. Okay. Since it is owned by the owner. Got it. I just wanted to identify where the uh, garage is located <laughs> on, on there. Yes, it's, it's actually um, everywhere. It's, it's, Below the entire the entire site, oh, okay. so except for the elevated short public walkway. So where's the point of entry again? A points of entry. Yeah. So there's a point of entry up here, going into the garage. There's another point of entry on the Northern Drive, and then there is a point of entry along Arthur Cove Road, going directly into the site. So there's three points of entry. And it will span the entire site. Yes, that's correct. Um, these entire these seven buildings would be on top of the garage. Thank you. Other questions? Lots of issues to be flushed out during the public review period and when it comes back. Thank you. This application is certified. Item number four, page 117, our first Brooklyn certification. A zoning map and zoning text amendments to facilitate the development of a new affordable building in the Coney Island neighborhood Community District 13. Our presenter is Alex Somer, Deputy Director of the Brooklyn Office. We are on item number four, page 117. Good afternoon, Commissioners. So I'll be covering for Richard today. So I'll try and do this project justice. So this is a private application by Arker Companies requesting a zoning map change and a zoning text amendment to facilitate a new 145,000 square foot development with 153 apartments that are 100% affordable. The project site is located in southern Brooklyn on the Coney Island Peninsula in Community District 13. Uh, to the south and east is MCU Park, home of the Brooklyn Cyclones and the Coney Island Amusement Area. Regalman Boardwalk and the waterfront is located two blocks to the south. Subway service is accessible 13 blocks east, or about one mile, via the B, F, N, and D lines at the Coney Island Stillwell Avenue station. The B-74 bus line travels along Mermaid Avenue and connects to the Stillwell Avenue subway station as well. 
The project area is located on a block bounded by Neptune Avenue to the north, West 28th Street to the east, West 29th Street to the west, and Mermaid Avenue to the south. To the immediate north is a 26-acre Kaiser Park with baseball fields, basketball courts, a running track, handball courts, fishing pier, barbecue area, and restrooms. The blocks to the east and west of the project block are characterized by two-story, single-family attached partnership homes with some commercial and community facility uses located along Mermaid and Neptune Avenues. The blocks to the south include a number of high-rise housing complexes, including the 16-story Ocean Gate complex and the 24-story Sea Park East and West complexes. Within the proposed project area, there's an existing 15-story, 122-unit housing development with open space and surface parking. This was constructed in 1972 through the Mitchell Lama program. The Empire State Development Corporation originally developed the project and then took title again back in 1989 through a deed in lieu of foreclosure. The property had fallen into serious disrepair and the applicant was selected through an RFP process by Empire State to preserve the existing affordable units on the site. In 2006, the applicant entered into a 50-year regulatory agreement with the Department of Housing and Community Renewal for the substantial rehabilitation of that building. The surrounding area, uh, including the project area on Block 7011, is mapped primarily with a low-density R5 residential district. The C12 commercial overlay is mapped to a depth of 150 feet along Mermaid Avenue and the Neptune Avenue block frontage of the proposed project area. Along Neptune Avenue, the proposed project area consists of a one-story house of worship and a 35-space surface parking lot utilized by that house of worship. The interior of the block consists of the proposed development site, the existing 15-story Mitchell Lama building, and a number of two-story partnership houses on the west side of the block. To the south along Mermaid Avenue, the project area includes 11 tax lots with uh, one to four story commercial and mixed use residential buildings. R6 districts uh, and C12 overlays are mapped south of Mermaid Avenue with 13 to 21 story height factor developments and one to three story commercial and mixed use developments along the corridors. The existing 89,000 square foot zoning lot is currently improved with the 15 story tower and its related open areas and surface parking. To the south and west of the building, there's an open sitting area with a small concrete playground uh, surrounded on its periphery by trees. To the north of the building, along West 28th Street, there's a surface parking area with 43 spaces, a hardscaped athletic area with, and, uh, with basketball and handball courts. So here's some photos of the proposed uh, project area. Um, on the top of the image, you can see the 15-story tower. On the bottom left is the existing surface parking lot. Um, and then here's the existing surface parking lot, as well as some of the hardscapes uh, recreation areas, including the basketball and handball courts. So the applicant is proposing the development of two new eight-story buildings with 153 apartments, 100% uh, affordable under HPD's extremely low and low-income affordability program, known as ELLA. And this would be located on the northern portion of the project site. Uh, the existing 15-story Mitchell Lama Tower on the southern portion of the site would remain in place. The applicant proposes to subdivide the existing uh, 89,000 square foot zoning lot into two zoning lots. The southern portion with the existing building would become a nearly 50,000 square foot lot A. And the proposed development site, which occupies uh, the northern portion of the uh, lot, would become a new 39,000 square foot lot B. This is where the two new buildings would be uh, developed on the site. The existing 43 space parking area would be shifted south next to the existing building. And then the new buildings uh, would include 68 new parking spaces on the ground floor and surface parking area to the rear. Two new curb cuts would be located along West 28th Street. Two outdoor recreation areas would be modified with an open space area to the north. The West 28th Street open area in front of the existing 15 story tower would be maintained. Um, and the new developments would include additional amenity spaces in the interior of, of them. So this is a uh, new development would be located just north of the existing 15 story tower. Uh, it would rise to eight stories, um, about 79 feet, after a 15 foot setback at about 61 feet. A smaller seven story, 70 foot tall portion of the building would be located to the north of the site. The new development would have a total of about 145,600 square feet of floor area, or about 3.7 FAR, 
and, res and would result in 153 uh, new apartments, 100% affordable under the ELLA program. Uh, the, applicant are cur the applicant is currently proposing a unit mix of 23 studios, 68 one bedrooms, 39 two bedrooms, and 23 three bedrooms. I can go over that again later if you have additional questions. Um, because the project area's location is in the AE flood hazard zone, the buildings must be designed to meet the requirements of New York City building code in order to minif minimize the effect of flooding. At this, uh, New York, at this location, the New York City Preliminary Flood Insurance Rate Maps, or FIRMS, indicate a base flood elevation, BFE, of 11 feet. The building will have a design flood elevation of 12 feet, which includes the one foot of freeboard uh, indicated in the blue line on this uh, drawing. Below this elevation, only crawl spaces, parking, storage, and building access are allowed. Additionally, you'll note that the boiler equipment and standby generator will be located on the roof of the building, and electrical and gas systems will be elevated above the first floor. To facilitate this development, the applicants are proposing a zoning map amendment to change an R5 and R5C12 zoning districts to R5, R6, R6A, and R7A C24 zoning districts as follows. Two R7A C24 districts fronting Mermaid Avenue and Neptune Avenue would be mapped to a depth of 100 feet. An R6A district would encompass the middle of the project area fronting on West 28th Street and would encompass the majority of the proposed new development site. An R6 district would be mapped just north of the R7A C24 district on Mermaid Avenue. This R6 district is a height factor district mapped over the area of the existing 15-story Mitchell Lama building, making the existing building compliant. Uh, this rezoning includes removing the existing C12 overlays, which are currently mapped to a depth of 150 feet from Neptune and Mermaid Avenues, and remapping C24 overlays to a depth of 100 feet. This would remove the existing overlays from a portion of low-rise buildings that are currently mapped with an overlay up here to the north, um, while encouraging a wider range of local retail and services along these two important uh, corridors. Additionally, um, for the zoning map amendment, the applicant is proposing a zoning text amendment to designate a new MIH housing area. The applicant is proposing to map both MIH, um, MIH options one and two across the proposed rezoning area, um, and are proposing to utilize the option one, which is 25%, which averages out to 60% of AMI, with 10% required to be affordable at 40% of AMI. However, as described earlier, the entire development would be 100% affordable pursuant to HPD's ELLA program. And so that concludes my presentation. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner, Commissioner Knuckles. Uh, the ELLA program is also permanently affordable. No, it's, it's 60 not. Years. 60. 60. <laughs> Commissioner Delos. Um, so the applicant doesn't own the properties that are along Mermaid Avenue that are one to four stories currently. Is that correct? Uh, they don't own, they own a small portion uh, of this property right here. So they are, they are, this is part of the zoning lot for the new development and they are pulling floor area from here. Uh -huh. And then this is the house of worship and a surface parking area. Okay. Um, and then these down here yep. are all non-applicant controlled. Okay. And, and the zoning there is not current R7A, that's currently R5? The entire project area is currently R5 with C12 overlays to a depth of 150 feet. And so why, why do we believe that R7A is appropriate, especially outside the area on Mermaid Avenue? Consider so, the current context. no, that's a, it's a great question. And so the both corridors, Neptune Avenue and Mermaid Avenue are really important corridors in Coney Island. Um, and actually, I have some pictures of, so this is what uh, Mermaid Avenue looks like today. Uh, there's a series of uh, mostly three-story uh, with some one- and two-story developments along this area. Uh, the combination of R7A and C24 would facilitate growth uh, in this area. Um, some of the sites were uh, discussed as projected sites in the environmental review. Um, however, it should be noted that with the R7A would include both new housing opportunities as well as affordable housing opportunities. Um, would have facilitate, if there was new development, uh, to meet new flood resiliency standards. Um, and a combination of R7A and C24 would further encourage uh, retail activity along these in corridors. So that was the thought process behind that. 
but the applicant can discuss more about their rationale for the zoning. Some of those buildings may have big residential units above that might be rent stabilized, so it'd be helpful to know that when it comes back. I can, I can actually, so on, to be specific on rent stabiliz stabilization, we can, we can confirm. I have uh, some numbers here on w the number of units in, on specifically Mermaid Frontage, which we pulled from the environmental, um, which show the number of units. I think we were a little conservative uh, when, when the applicant was reviewing these. So we assumed a lot of assemblages, most of them are actually not assembled today and have multiple separate owners with small lots. But we can get some more of the, uh, the details of any, if anything is stabilized at all. That'd be great. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, this application is certified. Thank you. Okay. Now we're on item number five, page 147. Also for certification, a zoning map and text amendments to facilitate the enlargement of an existing medical facility in the Homecrest Neighborhood Community District 15. Our presenter is Daphne Lundy of the Brooklyn office. We are on item number five, page 147. Good afternoon, Commission. This is a private application by Omni Enterprises requesting a zoning map amendment to portions of two blocks along Avenue P from R5B to R7A within the Homecrest Neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 15. In addition, the applicant seeks a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. These proposed actions would facilitate, would facilitate a 14,880 square foot enlargement to the NYU Langone Levitt Medical Center. The medical center is an existing five story, 19,536 square foot building located at 1220 Avenue P. The site is within the Homecrest neighborhood of Brooklyn. The area is predominantly comprised of two to three story, one and two family homes with a cluster of six story residential buildings along East 13th and East 14th Street. The area was part of the 2006 Homecrest rezoning, a 70 block rezoning of predominantly residential areas bounded by Avenue P to the north, Ocean Avenue to the east, Coney Island Avenue to the west, and Avenue S to the south. The goal of the rezoning was to preserve the neighborhood scale by mapping contextual districts. The rezoning also sought to create opportunities for new residential development along wide streets such as Ocean Avenue and Kings Highway, as well as side streets near the Kings Highway subway station. As a result of the Homecrest rezoning, the medical center was rezoned from R6, a medium density non-contextual district, to R5B, a low density contextual row house district. The rezoning area consists of 10 tax lots fronting on Avenue P, East 12th Street and East 13th Street. The lots are primarily developed with community facility and residential uses with a total of 38,000 square feet. Block 6774, lots 6, 7, and 9 are each developed with two to three story, one and two family homes ranging on lots ranging in size between 3,000 and 4,000 square feet. Lot 67, lot 6775, lot 1 and 5 are each developed with two story community facility buildings a private religious high school, and a synagogue. Both are owned and, op and operated by the Jewish Center of Kings Highway. Each lot is approximately 8,000 square feet. Block 6775, lot 9, is the existing NYU Langone Levitt Medical Center and is a five-story building on a 4,000 square foot lot fronting on Avenue P. Lot 12 is a 2,000 square foot lot fronting on East 13th Street that is used as surface parking for the medical center. Lot 13 is a 2,000 square foot lot that contains a two-story residential building with an accessory home occupation use. Both lots 74 and 75 are two-story warehouse buildings on 2,000 square foot lots. Lot 75 was previously used as a house of, house of worship but is currently vacant. The applicant is proposing a five-story enlargement to the medical center with approximately 14,880 square feet of additional floor area. The proposed development site consists of four contiguous tax lots that are approximately 10,000 square feet. The development site has a 40-foot frontage on Avenue P, 140-foot frontage on East 13th Street, and a 20-foot frontage on East 12th Street. The proposed five-story enlargement would be constructed on Lot 12, which is currently vacant and used for parking, as well as Lot 13, which contains a two-story building that would be demolished. Six accessory attended parking spaces would be provided to the west of the enlargement on um, East 12th Street. 
The proposed enlargement would have a maximum height of approximately 63 feet. The proposed enlargement combined with the existing medical center would result in a development that has an overall floor area of 34,460 square feet with a total FA FAR of 3.4. In order to facilitate the proposed development, Omni Enterprises is proposing a zoning map amendment to rezone an R5B district to R7A and a zoning text amendment to designate a new mandatory inclusionary housing area. While community facility uses are permitted in R5B districts, the maximum FAR is two. The maximum FAR for community facility uses in R7A is four. R absent the proposed zoning map amendment action, the applicant would be unable to construct the proposed enlargement under the existing R5B bulk regulations for community facilities. According to the applicant, the expanded building would allow the medical center to serve an increased demand for healthcare and medical services in the community. While the proposed development does not contain any new residential use, the applicant is requesting to designate the proposed rezoning area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area with option one and option two. In conclusion, these actions would facilitate a five-story, 14,880 square foot enlargement to the NYU Langone Levitt Medical Center located in Homecrest, Brooklyn. I'll be happy to take questions. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner Fun. Thank you. Is there any plan to have 24-hour emergency care um, in this new medical facility? Um, I can reach out to the applicant for clarification. Um, my understanding is that facilities like this basically uh, function, the, the idea of these centers is that instead of having to go to the city for a, a, a range of services, it's, it's more accessible. Um, currently, I don't believe that the site has 24-hour um, uh, ambulatory use, but I'll confirm with the applicant. Other questions? Commissioner Dwight. Just a comment and a, and a question. So I, I know the area well. I think it's ambitious uh, in R7A in that, in that neighborhood contextually. But there's a, a, in the briefing package, there's a comment that says the proposed enlargement would, not, would have a maximum height of 63 feet. That is their own, that, that they're setting that parameter on themselves or? Uh, yes, because um, so in the in the darker color is the existing building, so the new enlargement would just basically be matching the height of the um, current building. But they're not by law restricted to 63 feet under an R7A. Correct. Right. So my question to the applicant when this comes around would be, how do we ensure that restriction stays in place? Because the height would be a, a factor in that. Commissioner Delarouge. Two, two questions. It would be helpful when this comes back to know what their interaction has been with the two uh, community facility uses that are adjacent that would. Um, oh, the. Um, yeah, the synagogue, the synagogue and the high school. school. Yeah, that would be helpful to know. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I'm trying to understand what this is going to look like. Um, and right now, the, the, the rendering that we have is not necessarily helping all that much with that, especially from the various angles, um, considering that there's, when you add up, you know, lot 75 and 12, you end up with the whole two blocks. So it would be helpful to have uh, perspectives from of the rendering from various angles. I'll follow up with the applicant. Thanks. Vice Chair Knuckles. So I just want to clarify, the, the uh, MIH designation is required by the upzoning notwithstanding the fact that there is no residential component. Exactly. So right. if it were to be brought back to the two of the different use, the MIH right. would be in place. Right. So just, yes, Commissioner Dwight. Just to follow up, the Omni Enterprises are the developers, but the operator is NYU Langone? Um, Omni Enterprises, uh, they are also the owners. So it's, it's the NYU Langone Levitt Medical Center. So originally it was a medical center um, created by the applicants, but they joined the NYU family um, as an expansion. And they're operating it under, uh, so who, who, who owns the, will NYU have a lease with this property? Um, I can follow up with the applicant about the, the actual relationship and I'll uh, structure. My concern. my concern is that we remap, we zone it R7A and then the balance does not get built as a community facility, but it gets built as residential. Certainly, there's a, a benefit to the community in having a community facility, but I don't know if this is in scope for residential uh, in, that, in that area. So that's my concern. So I want to ensure that it's really going to be operated as a medical facility as per the application. Understood. Thanks. Other questions? Commissioner Fun. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
questions? Okay. Again, lots of questions during the public for the public review process, and this application is certified. Okay, the next item is item number six, page one six seven, for certification: a special permit to modify use and bulk regulations to allow for a for-profit educational tutoring facility in the Upper East Side Community District Eight. Stephen Johnson from the Manhattan office will present item number six, page one six seven. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is a private application by Advantage Testing Incorporated as well as the Church of the Holy Trinity for the property located at 350 East 88th Street for a special permit pursuant to landmark preservation in all districts. The applicant is seeking a use modification to allow a for-profit educational tutoring and test prep service. The modification of use provisions would permit the commercial educational use, which is a use group 6B use in the R8B district. The applicant is also seeking a bulk rear yard modification to permit the existing rear terraces within the required year rear yard to be enclosed. Uh, 350 East 88th Street is known as the Rhinelander Building, and the parsonage of the Church of the Holy Trinity is known as the Rectory, and was designated as an individual landmark in 1967. The Church and Advantage Testing have reached an agreement to merge zoning lots, lots which allows them to seek the special permit pursuant to meeting the conditions, findings, and approvals from LPC. Uh, the building is located here in Yorkville in this red area here. This is the Rhinelander and this is the parsonage of the Church of the Holy Trinity. These are the other landmark buildings related to the church. Um, directly south of the building is the Briarly School one-story uh, field house. It's one story, but they have a green playing field on top of the building. And the 46-story Leighton House condos are on the corner of 88th and 1st Avenue, and that was completed in 1988. The Q subway station is located at 2nd and 86th Street. The area is dominated by five and six story uh, multiple dwelling buildings on the mid blocks, which coincide with the RAB. And the avenues have the R10 or R10 equivalents and obviously have the larger, bulkier buildings. There are no historic districts or landmarks other than the Church of the Holy Trinity. Uh, the Rhinelander building is located here. This is the building, it's got an R on the front of it. That's the building. This is the parsonage next to it. Um, Moore Islander was built in 1892. It's four floors and approximately 18,000 gross square feet and 14,600 square feet of floor area and a height of 72 feet. Uh, it was originally built as a school for children living in tenement housing in order to teach them the manual trades. In 2016, Advantage Testing purchased the building from the Children's Aid Society, which had been using it as a 400 plus seat school. Uh, we have pictures of the rear of the building here. Uh, this is the Rhinelander with the blue fencing, which was uh, put up when it was the Children's Aid Society. This is the parsonage right here. The parsonage here, the Rhinelander. Obviously, this green area here is the Briarly School uh, Field House. We have the rear yard open space diagram. Uh, as you can see, the 30 foot required rear yard line here. Um, this is the Rhinelander, and this is the parsonage. Uh, the most unique thing about the, the rear yard is that the church is pushed back, obviously, to the rear yard because this is the church here. So the open space is in the front, while the typical mid blocks have the buildings all pushed to the front. Um, here we have the existing site plan for the second floor. The Rhinelander has uh, two terraces that are not enclosed, a west, an east, and a west, and then they have a uh, uh, skylight between the two. And they have their HVAC systems here, and the red line obviously represents the 30-foot uh, diagram here of the uh, required 30-foot rear yards. And this is the Briarly right back here. Uh, you can kind of see it here, but it's a little hard to see, but it's like an 8-foot existing rear yard at the site. So the proposed zoning lot site plan, uh, it's, a, it's a roof plan looking down on the site. The applicant is proposing to remove the skylight uh, and enclose the two terraces and the skylight and move the HVAC systems to these, this area here on top of the new uh, enclosed area. The proposed um, waiver plan here shows the 30-foot rear yard line and everything that would need to be waived out for the project. We have the proposed second floor plan uh, with the assorted tutoring rooms. You can see that they're enclosed now right there. That's for the added rooms for the tutoring. And then we have the proposed third floor. This is the HVAC system on top of the uh, second floor. 
And finally, for the fourth floor, we have another enclosed area that's not within the 30-foot rear yard, but it's right here. And we'll be enclosing that area also. So here we have uh, an enlargement of the waiver sections. Uh, the top one is showing a section through the rear of the building. Uh, you can see the tutoring rooms in the uh, hatching, and of course, three uh, HVAC systems on top of that. And in the bottom below section, as the, the highlights are the existing rear yard right back here. This is the Briarly School field house up to that level, and there's the 30 foot uh, rear yard line. So uh, the applicant has reached an agreement with the church for a zoning lot merger with the parsonage. The LBC has approved a comprehensive restoration plan to protect the parsonage from water damage, replace and repair pipes, roof, slate, gutters, flashing dormers, et cetera. The <coughs> brief and package includes relevant LPC design approval documents, including an MOU and a certificate of no effect. And there would also be a continuing maintenance plan for the building. Additionally, the restrictive declaration would also establish that the pro's second <coughs> floor terrace enclosure uh, would be demolished prior to the occupancy of the Rylander by a conforming use. So in effect, if they sold the building, then the enclosed terrace would have to be removed. Uh, Advantage Testing is a for-profit educational tutoring and test prep service. The commercial educational use is not listed in the ZR and does not meet the ZR requirements for a use group three definition of a school, which must also meet the requirements of the New York State education law. The applicant believes that the commercial educational use is most similar to the use group 6B offices which is not a permitted use within an RAP district. As part of the 74 set 11, the special permit requires these conditions and findings that are listed on the slide here. Happy to take any questions. Questions from commissioners? Yes, Vice Chair. Stephen, please, please uh, repeat the provision about if, if it is resold, the parcel is resold. Sure. So the applicant uh, was adamant about going out with the nonprofit commercial educational use. So they feel like it would be advantageous to them to go out with that with the community board and for uh, public review. So they want the restrictive declaration to state that if it goes to a regular 6B office, and a typical office, that uh, it, the uh, restrictive deck would say you can't do that, it can only be a nonprofit educational use. And if it goes to some other use, then they would have to remove the enclosed second floor. I should say for the record, I am familiar with advantage testing, though I'm sure it's not a conflict because um, as my son uses them, we are paying them, not the other way around. <laughs> um, but um, I, I believe the Brearley School Fieldhouse is a solid wall behind, and there are no windows having That's been there once or twice. So um, I assume we'll hear from Brearley if there's any issue, but it seems like as far as we are to go, that's uh, not an issue. Yeah, as far as we know, it's not an issue with Rarely. You can see from the photos, this is the level of their playing field. Uh, you can see the enclosure would be right around there. On the side of the building. Uh, but I'll ask the applicant if they've had any contact with the Rarely school. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, another application certified. Moving on to item number seven, page 201, for referral, a modification to previously approved authorization to facilitate the enlargement of commercial and community facility floor area in an existing mixed use building in the Upper West Side Community District 7. Please welcome our presenter, Nabila Malik, from the Manhattan office, giving her first presentation to the City Planning Commission. Item seven, page 201. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is an application by Columbus 95th Street LLC for a modification of an existing large-scale residential development located within the former West Side Urban Renewal Area on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in Community District 7. The LSRD was created in 1963 to control floor area for residential, commercial, community facility, and open space uses for individual sites and the LSRD as a whole. The commission adopted a text amendment in 2008 which enables owners of LSRD sites to apply for modifications in order to construct enlargements that utilize available commercial and community facility floor area in accordance with the underlying zoning. This modification would facilitate the development of approximately 27,000 square feet of non-residential floor area. The project site circled in red is located on West 95th Street between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West. Several high-density residential towers are located in C19 and C28 
district along Columbus Avenue and Amsterdam, while um, medium density residential properties are located along the mid blocks within the R72 districts. The site is served by the A, B, and C subway lines located at West 96th Street and Central Park West, and the one, two, and three lines located at West 96th and Broadway. This is the existing project site located between West 96th, West 95th, and the entire block front along Columbus Avenue. The site is a split lot with a C19 zoning district along Columbus Avenue and the remaining eastern portion in an R9 zoning district. The site is developed with two buildings, a 33-story, 247,000 square feet, primarily residential tower known as Columbus House, and a detached single-story commercial building on the southwest corner of the site over here. Both buildings are set back approximately 30 to 50 feet from the street line. Columbus House has 249 rental units, 179 of which are rent stabilized. The building was constructed under the Mitchell Lama program but is no longer subject to it. And the commercial space includes four retail spaces totaling around 9,000 square feet, Banco Popular and a <coughs> Subway restaurant both located in the tower and a Chinese restaurant and natural food store occupying the single-story commercial building. There are two accessory garages with 98 spaces in the R9 district located here. And this is the current entrance to the residential building seen from Columbus Avenue and West 95th Street. This is the proposed development for the site. The new floor area would be constructed as a two-story enlargement extending from the existing residential tower out to the street line. The enlargement on all three street frontages would replace existing paved open areas, the existing ground floor commercial space, and the existing ground level garage on West 96th Street. Of the proposed additional 27,000 square feet of floor area, around 15,000 would be use group six retail and 12,000 square feet would be community facility use with at least seven retail units and two community facility spaces. The residential entry plaza would include new benches, paving and planting beds with enhanced lighting and would be accessible to the public. The second floor would contain approximately 10,000 square feet of new commercial floor area and about 5,000 square feet of new community facility floor area. And a portion of the rooftop would include an outdoor amenity space for the tenants with a community garden area and movable tables and chairs. So the ground floor plaza here is open to the public while the second floor rooftop amenity area is um, open solely to the tenants. The proposed enlargement and improvements to the open space were approved by the Columbus House Tenants Association in March 2016. Based on the proposed development, the applicant seeks a modification of an existing large-scale residential development, allowing for increased commercial and community facility floor area on the site above the amount permitted by the LSRD but in accordance with the underlying zoning. The modification would facilitate the development of specifically 27,544 square feet of new non-residential floor area, resulting in a total of 36,741 square feet of commercial and community facility floor area at the site. The amount of residential floor area would remain unchanged. Four previous enlargements to existing buildings within the LSRD have been approved by the commission under this amendment. This project is the fifth proposed modification. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Delhaus. Uh, one, we have, what would the community facility use be? Do they know yet or? No, so um, at this time the applicant um, has yet to determine the community facility uses or the um, commercial uses, but they have um, reached out to the existing commercial retailers, including the bank and the Subway restaurant, the Chinese restaurant, and the natural food store um, to offer them a space in the enlargement. Um, 
but so far only the natural food store has agreed to stay on and they have a long-term lease agreement. Okay, thanks for that. And if I may, um, I know some, one of the things that has come up in these uh, modifications in the past is um, where the HVAC units will be in relation to the residential units um, and so it'd be helpful to have that information and how that's been taken into consideration for the design. Okay, I can um, reach out to the applicant to make sure. Yes, Commissioner Orr, please. So here are the proposed street frontages. Um, in terms of the exact length between the units, I can um, double check with the applicant to get exact numbers on that. Yeah. Right. So on Columbus Avenue, um, what they're proposing is um, five retail units that would front along that block while on 96th Street, it would be two um, community facility spaces and two retail units. So the question is, what's the height? Is there a right, okay. Yeah, I can double check that. Other questions? Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. I assume that all of the, uh, the prior four, I think you said mm -hmm. that we had approved, have all been built out by now, is that correct? Um, I believe so. But I can, I can double check that to make sure that all four of them have been. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, we will refer this to the community board for 45 days. Okay, hey, item number eight, page 241, also for referral, a modification to previously approved special permit to reflect design changes in the NYU large scale general development in community district two. Our presenter is Sylvia Lee from the Manhattan office, item eight, page 241. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The applicant, New York University, seeks approval of a modification to the previously approved special permit as part of the NYU Large Scale General Development, which I'll refer to as NYU LSGD in my presentation, to reflect certain massing adjustments and design changes to the proposed building located at 181 Mercer Street in Manhattan Community District 2. The dashed red line shows the boundary of the NYU LSGD, the site of the proposed uh, 181 Mercer Street building is to be constructed here in the south block. The project site is within NYU's core campus and is located south of Washington Square Park, east of South Village, west of NoHo, north of Soho. The surrounding area contains a mix of institutional, residential, and commercial uses where buildings vary from historic townhouses to medium density lofts and higher density residential and commercial buildings. The NYU LSGD superblocks are zoned C17, which permits commercial uses up to 2 FAR, residential up to 6.2 FAR, and community facility used up to 6.5 FAR. Some background on the NYU LSGD. Uh, the NYU LSGD and related actions were approved in 2012 to facilitate expansion of the NYU's main campus in the Washington Square area. Pursuant to the approvals, NYU will be constructing four new buildings and about three acres of parks and publicly accessible open space. By 2031, the proposed actions are intended to result in the development of about one million zoning square feet of new uses with an additional one million square feet um, below grade facilities. The two super blocks within the LSGD are bounded by West 3rd Street to the north, Mercer Street to the east, West Houston Street to the south and LaGuardia Place to the west. The two blocks are divided by Bleaker, uh, Bleaker Street. 181 Mercer Street is located again on the eastern end of the south block to the east of the Silver Towers. The site was previously occupied by Cole's Gym, uh, which has 
been demolished in anticipation of construction of the new building. The proposed building at 181 Mercer Street will be a multi-purpose academic building that contains retail, public, institutional pro public and institutional programs, student and faculty housing. The building is designed to have a base that rises to about 85 feet in height and six tower components with varying heights on top of the building base, which I'll refer to as C, D, E, F, G towers in accordance with the notations on the drawings. You may recall that the proposed building was sometimes referred to as the Zephyr Building for its staggering massing and variegated subvolumes that shift in the east-west direction. Um, at the time of the approval, a maximum building envelope and certain bulk waivers were granted to facilitate and memorialize the design concept and building configuration. Subsequent to obtaining the approvals in 2012, in the process of fine-tuning the design, program, and construction of the 181 Mercer Street building, a series of design changes and modest adjustments to the massing have been considered. Most of these changes are substantially compliant with the 2012 approvals. Others are included in this modification application for the, commi for the commission's consideration. In sum, prepared, compared to the approved product, the building as currently designed would contain less floor area overall, maximize the functionality of the programs, however require adjustments to the previously approved maximum building envelope and waiver areas to reflect reconfiguration of certain building components uh, and more fine-tuned articulation. The applicant proposes three changes, which will be detailed in the following slides. To summarize, the modification includes envelope adjustment to the C, D, E towers, which are student housing, reconfiguration of G tower, which would be occupied by NYU's music program and mechanical equipment, envelope and waiver adjustment to H tower, which is the faculty housing tower located at the corner of Houston and Mercer Street. Firstly, the applicant proposes to modify the maximum building envelope for the C, D, and E towers along their western and eastern facades. The proposed modification is highlighted in yellow on the right. This slide shows the change on the Mercer Street frontage. The following slide shows the change on the Green Street Walk frontage. Sections in the following slides show, illustrate the approved envelope line in blue, proposed in red with yellow highlighting the change. Using, uh, using E Tower as an example, the original horizontal setback required by the original building envelope will be eliminated and replaced by a modified building envelope that is more reflective of the adjusted building design, which has interlocking <laughs> vertical setback components that break up the massing of the towers and provide visual entrance. These building envelope adjustments do not affect any previously uh, granted head and setback waivers. Secondly, the applicant proposes to reconfigure G Tower to a lower L-shaped building element that wraps around H Tower. Previously approved, currently proposed. Instead of stacking bulk uh, vertically in the form of rectangular tower as previously approved, bulk would ex will instead will instead extend east towards uh, Mercer Street, but still step back from the street. The modification would reduce the overall bulk of the G Tower and decrease its height by about 30 feet from 168 feet to 138 feet, including bulkheads. The applicant states that the re reconfiguration would allow NYU to maximize the building functionality to better ne meet the needs of the music program and maximize the efficiency of the mechanical equipment occupying the second level of the G Tower. Lastly, the applicant proposes to adjust the approved maximum building envelope of the H Tower to better reflect the modified design and configuration. As previously approved, H Tower has a northern element located at the street line um, of Mercer Street and a southern element that is set back for about six feet from Mercer Street. As currently designed, the northern portion would instead step back from the street by about 13 feet above the base height, um, whereas the southern portion would come closer to the street line than previously approved. 
this shifting of bulk would require adjustment to the building envelope and heightened setback waivers. Specifically, the proposed new configuration would result in a reduction in heightened setback waiver above 85 feet in a northern portion of H Tower um, and an increase in waiver areas in the southern portion, uh, shown in red. Here are two sections taken through the southern and northern portions of H Tower, um, also illustrating the reduction and increase um, of the um, waiver areas. Um, the modest increase in uh, the southern portion of waiver area is shown here, and this is a reduction of the waiver area in the northern portion. The applicant states that the proposed change will reinforce the visual relationship between H Tower and other three towers and the cohesiveness of the design, in that the primary shearing on the top of H Tower is always in the same direction. Um, this configuration would also help optimize faculty apartment layouts. The new design also includes a wider setback along Houston Street uh, and, and a diagonally chamfered corner uh, to maintain openness at the street corner. To facilitate the previously described changes, the applicant seeks approval of a modification to the previously approved New York, New York University LSGD special permit to update the building envelope of the 181 Mercer Street building. The applicant's statement of findings is attached. It's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. My memory serves me <laughs> from this um, prior approval. Um, I think there were some folks on Mercer Street who were concerned about shadows. And I'm just wondering, with some of the shift in the bulk of Building G, um, whether that impacts on shadows at all on Mercer. Right. Um, so a technical memo um, has been prepared to analyze um, the shadow impact. Um, so the proposed changes would not result in any addi additional shadow impact. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Then we will refer this matter to the community board for 45 days. Thank you. Okay. Next is item number nine, page 269, our first pre-hearing item. A public hearing for a special permit to permit use group six retail use and accessory signage in a residential district in the Upper East Side Community District 8. Our presenter is Stephen Johnson from the Manhattan office, item number nine, page 269. Good afternoon again. This is a private application by 19 East 72nd Street Corporation for the property located at the same address for a special permit pursuant to section 74711 to modify the use regulations to allow use group six retail and service establishments with the exception of eating and drinking establishments in a residential district on the ground floor of the building. The special permit would allow an additional 1,836 square feet of retail on the ground floor of the building. The application was certified on June 19th and is back for pre-hearing review. And I'll take you through an abbreviated uh, presentation and get to the public review recommendations. Uh, the building is located in the Upper East Side Historic District. The district is outlined in red here on our map. Um, this here um, in Community District 8 the, on the north side of East 72nd Street and Madison Avenue. Um, Central Park is on the west, and the Frick is located down here in the blue. And uh, the St. James Church is also across the street up on 73rd Street. Um, the, the building is located within the special Madison Avenue Preservation District, which I will refer to as the MP, which runs from 61st to 96th. It was created in 1973 to preserve and protect the unique character and architectural quality of Madison Avenue and to enhance street life. The building is in a C51 zoning district, while the mid-blocks are mapped with the lower density R8 contextual. Uh, this is the East 72nd Street frontage. You can see it right here. Uh, this is the lobby of the building. This is 72nd Street. This is Madison here. There are two retail shops at the location. There's an art gallery here, the one without the awnings, and there's a perfumery right there with the small red awnings. Um, the building was completed in 1937 and designed by Rosario Candela. It has seven stories and 34 dwelling units. And um, that's it for that. 
So uh, East 72nd Street is 100 feet wide. It's across town street. You can see Central Park in the back here. This has the frontage of the building with landmarks next to it. You can see across the street the other types of contextual buildings in the area. There's high-end retail clothing shops on the corner. And we have the ground floor frontage on 72nd Street. It is 140 feet. You can see Madison Avenue right here. This is the frontage along 72nd Street. This is the dividing line between the two zoning districts. This is a blow up of that area. Um, there's a door located right here. This is used to be a doctor's office and the superintendent's building to the, to the site. We have a zoning lot site plan, gives you just a general idea of the entrances to the retail establishments on Madison here, the lobby, and the proposed entrance there. So the applicant is proposing to co convert the 1,800 square feet in the R10 district and combine it with a 478 square foot of floor area located adjacent to it in, to the east in the C51 district into a single retail space for a total of 2,314 square feet. Only the development site of the proposed retail space requires the requested modification. It's a little bit hard to see, but this area is hatched right here. This is the site right here. The supers unit is being moved back to the courtyard, which is located right there. We have an image of the uh, drawing of the proposed signage. Um, it consists of non-illuminated signage decals on two windows, one door, and one sign post for a total of 9.3 square feet of signage. There are no proposed awnings for the project, and there is no change to the existing landscape to the building. Included in your packages are the appropriate LPC documents uh, authorizing the work for the development. The project is also uh, subject to a continuing maintenance plan. Subsequent to the, to the June 19th certification, the applicant re filed a revised application mm -hmm. to allow the use Group 6 retail, but to exclude the retail, uh, sorry, the eating and drinking establishments on the site. They felt that was uh, uh, something they wanted to do uh, to uh, get approval from the community board. This is like the opposite with the Rhinelander building where they only wanted one. This, in this case, they took one out, just the one out for the eating and drinking establishments. Um, at the CB8 meeting on June, July 19th, they adopted a resolution recommending to disapprove the application by a vote of 23 to 12, with three abstaining. On August 25th, the Manhattan Borough President issued an approval recommendation with no conditions for the project. Happy to take any questions that you have. Questions from commissioners. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, could you clarify one thing for the fifth, oh, the seventh floor and uh, section 11? Is it a but for thing or a but for if uh, thing is moved, there will be other things? Yeah. Oh, not maintain. Well, uh, they would. Sure, so the building would like to see the space taken uh, and get a larger retail space so they could use that money to put into the upkeep for the building. So if this is an eight-story building, uh, is there a risk that they um, I don't think there would be a risk. Um, people who live in this building have are very affluent, but I think um, when you have vacant spaces in your building, uh, it'd be better to have it activated, I think, is what their proposal, their argument would be, uh, so they could have the space leased out, rented out, um, and used, and then they could use that money to have the upkeep of the building, but the cost of it, the, the issue of the cost for the building, I mean, it would still cost a significant amount of outlay to do the continuing maintenance plan, to have the upkeep for the landmarks, and to make all the... Uh, changes to the building that are proposed. information on it. I, I would assume that the reason why they did that is because it was divided and they just wanted to get the Yeah. I know they, they, they voted at it when it went to, 
before them for landmarks. Mm -hmm. They went to the landmarks committee at the community board before that. They voted against it. Then the applicant changed because they were very focused on the awnings. So they voted against it at the community board. So then they removed the awnings that LPC approved for the project. And then they did the, land, the transportation study to see how many people would be going in and out of the building uh, in response to the community board. Yeah. That's correct. It's 140 feet. That would, that would be a uh, good question for the applicant. I would assume that with the price per square foot on Madison and the potential less price per square foot, 140 feet over the door, it might be somebody might be willing to pay a reduced rate to the typical Madison <laughs> Avenue frontage price. Commissioner Funk. Thank you. It, it's a really special building on a very special block because it is the one wide entrance to Central Park that doesn't have a bus stop in front of it, um, uh, among other reasons. Um, and um, with complete appreciation for all the work that went into this and the changes that were made and the people who've come out in favor of it in writing, whom I respect enormously. Um, one of the really nice features of this is the, um, is the uh, greenery that goes the full length and then you have two buildings that were formerly schools and are now single family residences and there's greenery there. Mm -hmm. um, will it be an obligation to maintain the greenery? I know you said that they intend to, but. Um, I'll check in to see if it's an obligation. I would assume that they would maintain, they said they would maintain what the existing is. Uh, I don't know if there's any plans uh, to have a obligation to maintain it exactly the way this is on the cross. And, and the only thing, other thing I'd point out is that the two other sites that were photographed on the uh, Madison to Fifth blocks um, uh, were two hotels with eating and drinking establishments right. in them that service the hotels. And from what I understand, are also the room service caterer for those two hotels. So this is a slightly different. Um, and granted, it's not eating and drinking, which sounds like sure. a positive change from a community standpoint. Um, but it's not a commercial building. This is a sure. residential building, and it I would be one of the few sites, as I understand it, on the Fifth Madison block where it jumps over to the canopied entrance of the building to retail on the other side of the entrance. I think the other two hotels that you're referring to are on narrow streets. And one of the things that we were looking at here is that it was on a wide street. Um, and it exemplified an, exa you know, an existing interactive street, a busy street. And uh, the impacts from the proposed retail that they're looking for uh, would be minimal, which is why they did the transportation study. And I have one other question, if I may. Um, what, is there any plan for the ground floor space uh, to the east of the uh, front door of the building? No. This this is owned by a uh, individual stakeholder, I believe. This is the gallery here? So the gallery runs straight through the lobby to the front entrance. The gallery's on this site, and then the lobby and. This was where the uh, super building and the uh, uh, doctor's office was. And to get really picky, but the sure. gallery doesn't have signage on 72nd Street. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, and it's a private gallery, and they chose not to put up any right. signage. And would this open that up? No. No, they would be maintained by the existing. I mean, they're allowed to have signage in the MP district. They're in the MP district on the avenue. They're allowed no, to do No, of course, on the avenue. Yeah. Right. So. That. Yeah, it's only for the it's only for the site over here. It's only affects the site here on Seventy Second Street. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Delos. I, I just want to make sure I'm um, interpreting what the borough president wrote. Uh, she noted that the board's vote last year for for LPC with thirty nine folks. Um, in favor of that application, um, but then a year later, there there's 23 that oppose. No, no, sorry, 39 to deny the LPC yeah, application. For, yeah. But this, but a year later, 
not quite um, yeah, the full board voted unanimously to deny. So the major changes between the LPC application last year and this year were the awnings and the traffic and the pedestrian study that they did. Is that That's right? That's correct. And then they did the uh, took away the eating and drinking establishment idea. The three major changes that allowed some people to say we're no longer opposed. Yeah, that's correct. Other questions or comments? <coughs> okay, this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday the 6th. Okay, item number 10, page 326, for a public hearing, a proposal for an acquisition of a building for continued use of a daycare center in Community District 3, Manhattan. Our presenter is Yin Yu Liang from the Manhattan office, item number 10, page 326. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, this application was certified on May 22 and is coming back for pre-hearing reviews. The Administration for Children's Service and the Department of Citywide Administrative Service are seeking approval of the acquisition of an existing building to facilitate the continued operation of a child care center. The proposed action will allow for a 10 years lease renewal to be negotiated. The building is privately owned and has been leased for the city as a child care center since 1973. A previous acquisition application was approved by City Planning Commission on 1992. The site is located at 180 Suffolk Street in the Lower East Side of neighborhood of Manhattan Community District 3. Um, the site is zone R8A and R7A zoning districts with a C15 commercial overlay along Clinton Street frontage. Several public facilities, in institutions, and open spaces are within the 600-foot radius. The access, the Lancet Street uh, station, which is three blocks to the south of the site. The ACS Child Care Center facility is located in a three-story privately owned building and occupies the entire floors, including a cellar, two rooftop play area, and the ground level play area in the rear. Here are some photos um, taken when DCP staff toured the facility on May 4th, 2017, and confirmed that the facility was in a good state, a good repair, with general improvements to be made pursuant to the proposed scope of work. On May 22, the Department of City Planning certified this application. On June 14, the Community Board 3 held a public hearing and vote to approve this application with conditions that it will only be used as a child care center to allow continued operations. Also, the Community Board 3 urges the city to explore any and all ways to preserve this vital affordable child care, including but not limited to either a longer lease or outright purchase of property. On August 31st, the Manhattan Borough President issued a recommendation to approve the application, stating the important to ensure stability and longevity for these type of community facilities. The staff from Borough President Office also noticed that um, the nearby constructions has resulted in the parking of additional vehicles on this block, blocking entrance and egress to the daycare center and children who disembarked from the school buses are forced into the streets. The borough president office will work with the daycare center and department of transportation to request a designated no parking during school hours zones and recommend the city planning commission to do the same. Thank you. And now I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions from the commission? Yes, Vice Colonel. Well, just an observation. Uh, Painting and signage can help an otherwise drab building. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Make it less so. I was looking at this in comparison to another center that we had where we had commented on the grilled windows, and it is remarkable what a bright splash of blue does. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Efron. I have a question ab about no parking in front of daycare centers. Is this something we should be aware of, or um, is there any designation for no parking? or? Is there some expedited application for, with DOT for no parking in front of child care centers? Um, we will have, we'll definitely follow up with the Department of Transportation. And see I very much noted the borough president's recommendation on this. It just seemed to make so much sense, and <laughs> I thought it important that we in our report note that recommendation in the support of the commission and department staff can work with the Department of Transportation. Yeah, I, I guess it's the kind of question I'd want to know in a lot of daycare centers if it hasn't come up before, because it's certainly something I hadn't focused on. 
that seems like a safety issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we've seen a number of them where the entry is actually off of a, stri a side street mm -hmm. with no parking. This one seems to be right in the midst of a much busier street. Yes. Other comments or questions? Okay, another item for Wednesday's public hearing. Okay, on our first Brooklyn pre-hearing item, item number 11, page 347, for public hearing, a proposal for an acquisition of a building for continued use of a daycare center in the Crown Heights Neighborhood Community District 9. Our presenter is Kevin Kraft from the Brooklyn office, item number 11, page 347. Good afternoon, commissioners. The New York City Administration for Children's Services, ACS, and the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, request approval for the acquisition of a property to facilitate the continued use of the building as a child care facility. The last application for acquisition of the site was approved by the City Planning Commission on April 28, 1994. The 20-year lease for the property expired in 2015, and the applicants are requesting approval to execute a new 10-year lease. As you may recall, All My Children Daycare Center 11 is located in the Crown Heights neighborhood, Community District 9 in Brooklyn. The facility is located on the northeastern corner of Rogers Avenue and Montgomery Street. The project site is mapped within, R6, within an R6 zoning district with a C13 commercial overlay. The building is privately owned and has been leased by the city since 1974. All My Children Daycare occupies the entire three-story building, including the cellar and rooftop. The primary entrance is shown here on Rogers, or is on Rogers Avenue here, shown. These images show a typical classroom space, as well as the administrative offices, and the rooftop play area. This application was certified by the Department of City Planning on June 5th, 2017, and was duly referred to Brooklyn Community Board 9 and the Brooklyn Borough President. On August 7, 2017, Community Board 9 submitted a letter waiving review of this application, citing that it appears to be a continuation of, of business as usual for this daycare at this site. On August 10, 2017, the Brooklyn Borough President, President submitted a letter of support on this application, stating the important role of the daycare ser ser serves in a community bereft of affordable daycare services. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions from commissioners. Building on Vice Chair Knuckles' prior co comment on the prior, this is yet another example of the value of an awning, and in this instance, a mural that quite enlivens the, the daycare center. And I would suspect that um, when our urban design team comes back with a menu of options, these will be among the, the items that we'll suggest. If no other comments, then this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday. Okay, item number 12, page 362, also for public hearing, for proposed zoning map and text amendments to facilitate the development of a new mixed-use building in the Bedford-Stuyvesant Neighborhood Community District 3. Our presenter is Anthony Grande from the Brooklyn office. And item number 12, page 362. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a private application by JMS Realty Corporation for zoning map and zoning text amendments to facilitate the development of an eight-story mixed-use building containing 75 residential units, as well as retail and community facility space on the lower floors. Uh, the project area is located in uh, the northwestern portion of the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood uh, within community, dis community District 3, uh, shown on the map here. The project area consists of three tax blocks um, fronting on Myrtle Avenue. Um, the portions of those tax blocks within 100 feet of uh, Myrtle Avenue, as shown here. Um, the development site uh, is the area outlined in yellow on the map, uh, which is an approximately 15,000 square foot uh, lot with uh, frontage both on Myrtle Avenue as well as Sanford Street. Um, the development site currently has no improvements and is used as a parking lot for a truck rental business. Uh, the existing zoning is in the project area is M11 on the north side of Myrtle Avenue and M12 on the south side of Myrtle Avenue. Um, land uses in the surrounding area are mixed. Um, the uh, uh, industrial uses are found primarily within the M districts um, directly to the north as well as south of the project area. Um, residential uses in the area range from one and two family to uh, larger apartment buildings. Um, ranging in heights from uh, two stories to six stories. 
the area is well served by public transit with the MTAG line stop at Myrtle Willoughby Avenue, uh, one block to the east of the project area. The proposed development would be an eight-story mixed-use building uh, containing a commercial ground floor totaling 14, approximately 14,000 square feet, um, a community facility second floor totaling approximately 15,000 square feet, and residential use on floors three through eight totaling approximately 54,000 square feet. Um, the total number of units would be 75, uh, utili utilizing MIH option one. Uh, this building would provide 19 permanently affordable MIH units at an average of 60% AMI. There are two actions requested by the applicant. One is a zoning map amendment to amend the M11 districts uh, on the north side of Myrtle Avenue to an R7D C24 district, and to amend the M12 district on the south side of Myrtle Avenue to an R6A C24 district. Uh, additionally, the zoning text amendment would uh, create a mandatory inclusionary housing area um, within the project area, uh, mapping options one and two. Um, this application was certified on June 5th. On June 27th, Community Board 3 held a public hearing and voted to approve with no conditions, um, 23 in favor, five opposed, and two abstaining. Um, the borough president recommendation um, has not been received yet. Uh, today is the deadline for the borough president recommendation. Uh, we'll provide it to the commission as soon as we have it. Thank you. Commissioner Dwight. Just to, I know we don't have the official DP's recommendation in yet, but I think one of his concerns would be out of the 75 units, 72 are studio and one bedroom. And that's not commensurate with his uh, family size unit initially. So if the applicant could speak to the unit mix tomorrow um, and if we can increase the amount of uh, two bedroom, three bedrooms, or get, get some kind of mix in there above the three units that are currently in the proposed development. I'm sure the applicants can speak to that on Wednesday. Commissioner De La Luz. Um, does the applicant own any of the other properties uh, in the proposed rezoning area or just the development site? Um, just the development site um, at this time, yeah. Okay. And do we have an analysis or information about the number of rent-stabilized units in the other properties uh, that might be subject to the rezoning? Um, uh, I have information about the number of units that are on the other blocks that are within the rezoning area. Um, but not how many are rent stabilized. Rent stabilized. I don't have that information. I would. It seems as though a number of them are, just based on the size of the property and the age of the building. Mm -hmm. um, so, separate from the applicant's proposal, I may have a bit of concern about the potential loss of those rent stabilized units and what this may incentivize happening. Other comments? Yes, Commissioner Efron. Um, I assume we'll hear from the applicant or applicant team tomorrow, and I'm just curious about the 68 accessory parking spaces and whether they're designated for the occupants in the building, the neighborhood, um, or is it somehow tied to the 13,000 plus square feet square footage of the cell on the ground floor? What can you assist? Other comments? Okay, this is our final item going to public hearing on Wednesday. Okay, item 13, the first of five city council modifications. Anthony Grande from the Brooklyn office will also present. Uh, yes, so um, this is a city council modification uh, to the Ebenezer Plaza rezoning um, that was approved by the commission on uh, July 12th. Um, I'll just show a map to sort of demonstrate the uh, changes proposed by city council. Um, so as a reminder, this is the project area, uh, which was three tax blocks um, that was approved by um, the commission. Um, these two tax blocks, the larger one on the east and the middle block are the applicant's own sites that are part of the development site. Um, and then the westernmost block is the non-applicant controlled site that was included in the rezoning area. And then that's the block that was removed. This area shows uh, the project area as uh, proposed by the city council. Um, so 
uh, in, adduction, in, in addition to this reduction in the project area, uh, they would also be removing um, option two from the MIH options in the um, zoning text amendment. Uh, and I'll just quickly show, just as a reminder, the proposed project on those two blocks, um, the rendering. So I'll take any questions. Questions from the commission? They're removing mm -hmm. one M uh, It's just option yes. one. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then I will ask for an assent by show of hands to send a letter to the city council that the proposed modification is within scope. Done. Item 14, another city council modification regarding 34th Street Heliport. Bob Tuttle from the Manhattan office will present. Good afternoon, commissioners. So on June 21st, the CPC approved a 10-year special permit for the operation of the heliport at 34th Street. Um, there's no presentation. Okay. Um, <laughs> you'll have to be riveted by my explanation. <laughs> Uh, so see, the city council has provided its modifications uh, to that special permit, and DCP believes that these are within scope. They include denoting additional fencing and lighting on the periphery of the heliport, so that's a, a small drawing change, um, and then also some reporting requirements. Those reporting requirements include a monthly uh, report that details the 311 complaints, um, also a quarterly update regarding the number of flights, and specifically the number of variances of granted for flights that are outside of the normal business hours. And um, also that will include the 301 complaints. And then biannual, there'll be a maintenance and improvement plan update. And then at the five year mark, uh, there'll be a report that is about the performance of the operator. And at that point, EDC can choose to continue with that operator or cease their contract. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Delos. Who's the monthly report going to? So all these reports are going to um, the community board, the borough president, and city council. Commissioner Dweck. I, I can understand how they could report on the uh, variances, but how would they get the 311 report? They do actually receive all the 311 complaints. They're the ones that handle all of them. So the city receives them, but then they transfer them immediately onto the operator okay. um, through EDC. So EDC has all the information. Got it. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, the same drill and a sent by show of hands to send a letter to the city council saying that this modification is within scope. Done. Okay. Thank you. Um, we also have a city uh, council modification regarding DSNY Manhattan District 11 garage. Edwin Marshall from the Manhattan office is here to present. Good afternoon, commissioners. On June 21st, 2017, the commission voted to approve a site selection and acquisition by lease, as well as an amendment to the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan to facilitate this project. As the commission may recall, the approved actions would facilitate the relocation of the District 11 garage and lot cleaning headquarters from their present locations to a new facility to be located at 207 to 217 East 127th Street in East Harlem. On August 22, 2017, the Land Use Committee of the City Council, by a vote of 16 in favor, none opposed, and none abstaining, voted to approve and modify this application. As recommended, the Council's modification would limit the lease term to a term not exceeding 20 years. Uh, nothing else was modified by the Council. Upon review, the City Council's proposed modification raises no land use or environmental issues requiring further review. Questions? Okay, once again, a sent by a show of hands to send a letter to the City Council saying this is within scope. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, item 16, a City Council modification regarding 462 Broadway. Sylvia Lee from the Houghton office will present. flying through these. <laughs> um, good afternoon, commissioners, again. 
You may recall that the commission approved a good faith marketing special permit and a large retail special permit with modifications in July 2017 to facilitate a proposed large retail establishment in an existing loft building at 462 Broadway in, in Soho. The commission's approval would allow a single large retail store occupying about 29,000 zoning square feet of floor area with restricted loading and unloading on Crosby Street. Uh, subsequently, City Council disapproved the large retail special permit and proposes the listed um, modifications to the 74781 Good Faith Marketing special, per special Permit application. In brief, the modifications include limiting the size of the retail to no greater than 10,000 square feet, including cellar space, prohibiting nighttime loading on, and unloading on Crosby Street, adopting best practices um, with regards to loading and unloading, and other quality of life restrictions regarding illuminated signs, customer queuing, short-term uses, and trash collection. For reference, uh, these restrictions are added to the special permit drawings uh, with notes. Uh, the city charter provides that the commission must determine whether these proposed modifications are of such significance that the additional review of environmental or land use issues is required. Staff has prepared a draft scope letter included in your weekend packages. Here to answer any questions. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Um, I could verify that, but that seems to be what they need. So after the yeah, after ten hours of operation. Uh, my understanding is that DOB um, has certain protocols in terms of per, uh, permitting temporary uses, but I could verify that and, and follow up with Commissioner. I would just note that on these uh, scope determinations, it is a question of whether it's within scope rather than whether we think it's advisable. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Cirillo. Well, Commissioner Ortiz asked my question about the pop up <laughs> store. I, I, I know it's a, not a scope issue, but I just wondered what the process would be. I understand the challenge to the quiet enjoyment, but that's usually a legal question that would perhaps come after the fact. But prior to, I mean, some things we can imagine might be problematic, but in other cases, it's very, it's very opinion driven. So just wonder how the council assumed that would play out in the process. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Sorry, you know, a follow-up. If, if, you know, after this, we see that there are unintended consequences of that window of the form of what process is there potentially to reverse engineer? Or is there the process by which you might seek a different award? The applicant would have to file for a modification or for a new special permit without the conditions. So understanding the narrow scope of what we are asked to do, I would ask for an assent by show of hands to send a letter to the city council noting that the modifications are within scope. Okay, we'll do so. Thank you. And finally, our last city council modification regarding the downtown Far Rockway development plan. Brendan Pilar from the Queen's office will present. level of detail on the council modifications in this process I think points to the fact that this this neighborhood needs some special attention <laughs> uh, good afternoon commissioners uh, the positive momentum behind downtown Far Rockaway continued following the Commission's uh, public hearing on this uh, comprehensive neighborhood plan uh, and that sentiment was really reflected in uh, the city uh, council's uh, proposed modifications, uh, largely of two actions, the uh, proposed disposition of city-owned property 
and a zoning uh, text amendment. It's important to note that these proposed modifications do not raise any ULIP or seeker scope issues, but I do want to walk uh, them through, uh, walk you through them right now. Uh, as I mentioned, two actions are affected by the proposed modifications. One is the disposition of city-owned property, and the second is a zoning text amendment. Uh, we'll start with the uh, disposition of city-owned property. The commission and city council heard uh, significant testimony from uh, stakeholders were, who were interested in uh, a Department of Sanitation-owned site remaining in city ownership and having that site improved as uh, publicly accessible <coughs> open space. Uh, so the city council uh, modification removes this site from the disposition application. Uh, and the city is committed to transforming this 14,000 square foot site into parkland uh, with the input of community stakeholders. Uh, the next uh, series of uh, council proposed council modifications relate to zoning text amendments. Uh, the first uh, relates to the mandatory inclusionary housing area where both option one and option two are proposed. The council model would add the deep affordability option uh, to ensure that uh, there is uh, at least an option that uh, lower income uh, levels uh, be reached in the new development in downtown Far Rockaway. The second text modification relates to the uh, zoning treatments for proposed R6 districts within the mandatory inclusionary housing area. This is zoning text that would allow for wide street FAR and lot coverage provisions to apply. Uh, this would have applied citywide. Uh, this city council modification makes this geographically specific change to downtown Far Rockaway. This is consistent with what was approved for the Westchester Muse project. In the future, the commission heard earlier today a presentation where there's the potential to map uh, new R61 districts with mandatory inclusionary housing areas. Uh, that would essentially accomplish the same goal. So this is handled in text. In the future, it will be handled through uh, individual zoning map changes. So again, no change to how the rules are applied within downtown Far Rockaway. The third modification of the text relates to a uh, proposed uh, uh, authorization that would allow for modification of bulk regulations. The CPC approved text allowed this authorization to modify most bulk regulations within the uh, proposed downtown Far Rockaway Special District with the exception of height limits and uh, maximum length of building regulations in a sub-district of that special district. The, the council mod really narrows the scope of what types of buildings can use this authorization. It's restricted to buildings, only buildings that provide uh, income uh, restricted units, affordable uh, independent residences for seniors and other government assisted dwelling units. Uh, it essentially eliminates the use of the authorization for any vertical um, modifications of bulk. So this is really limited to uh, kind of horizontal bulk modifications. Uh, and uh, the extent of those horizontal bulk modifications uh, uh, cannot go any lower than what uh, multiple dwelling law uh, provides. Uh, additionally, the council eliminated a finding for the authorization that uh, the modifications would not cause traffic congestion in the surrounding area. And really the reason behind this uh, removing uh, this uh, uh, finding was because the council believed that the kind of scope of projects that would actually use this would not uh, uh, add to traffic congestion in the area. The next modification relates to uh, the publicly accessible open space requirements within sub-district A of the proposed special district. Uh, the council model would make minor adjustments to the dimension that establishes the open spaces along Mott Avenue. Uh, it would further specify that the space is open for 24 hours a day. It would increase the uh, requirement for litter receptacles from one per 10,000 square feet to one per 5,000 square feet of open space. It would also align the requirements for uh, information on signage with the requirements that are currently in the zoning text for, for uh, publicly accessible open spaces. The next uh, text modification relates to where uh, new uh, uh, publicly accessible private streets would be laid out. Uh, as was analyzed in the FEIS, the zoning text was not clear about uh, the location of private streets to the east of where a north-south private street would be located. So the uh, modified council modified uh, proposed modification of the zoning text would just clarify that a street could indeed be located within that area of the map. The next modifications relate to a new uh, height limits proposed within sub-district A. The commission uh, may recall this map, which established very uh, tight height limits around the periphery of uh, sub-district A within the proposed downtown Far Rockaway special district. There are special rules for where uh, the existing uh, private, uh, public street, Redfern Avenue, uh, and the intersections of new uh, of private streets 
Uh, the commission approved text established that there would be a 65 foot height limit within 75 feet of those intersections. The council mod uh, within 300 feet of Mod Avenue here uh, reduces that, that setback depth uh, to 25 feet. Uh, the next series of uh, modifications relate to how certain rules in the zoning text are, are applied. There are no changes to the uh, dimensions or uh, uh, the underlying requirements here. It's just, again, clarifying uh, how these rules would uh, apply to future development. So I'll close simply by saying that as the representative of dozens of colleagues here at the Department of City Planning and <laughs> other city agencies, it's tremendously exciting to have the city's uh, second comprehensive plan uh, on the cusp of adoption at City, city Council. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll also note uh, to Commissioner Delos's questions, one, the changes are at the margins, but certainly the department maintains a keen interest in the areas that are rezoned. We know that the city tracks the commitments that are made as part of the rezonings. And uh, Brendan, I suspect, will be appearing before us, coming forward to give us updates on progress under the rezoning. Other, other questions or comments? Okay, for the last time today, I will ask for an assent by show of hands to send a letter to the City Council, noting that the changes are within scope. Thank you. Okay, so in addition to the hearing on Wednesday, September 6th, staff have prepared favorable resolutions for the following items. We have the Westchester Avenue Bridge Rehabilitation. Also in the Bronx, we have 4725 Independence Avenue, which involves a certification that no authorization is required to facilitate an enlargement to an existing single family house in the special natural area district, community district eight. In Queens, we have All My Children Daycare Center six, uh, an acquisition of a building for continued use as a daycare center. Also in Queens, we have Northeastern Towers Annex LP and 135-01 35th Avenue rezoning. In Brooklyn, we have Albany Neighborhood Senior Center um, for Manhattan, there's the Block 4 Contribution in Kind, 66 Hudson Yards Authorization. Uh, in Staten Island, there's the South Avenue Retail Development. Um, also for Wednesday in Staten Island uh, is 45 Helena Road, which involves a series of authorizations to facilitate the construction of a two-car detached garage and modifications to existing terraces, new outdoor stairs and new retaining wall in the Special Natural Area District. Also a series of authorizations for 90 Old Farmers Lane in the Special Natural Area District. And lastly, St. Peter's Cemetery, also in Special Hillside Preservation District in Staten Island. Okay. Assuming there are no concerns about the above, we can move on to September 19th. For Pfizer Sites Rezoning, we have Alex Somer from the Brooklyn office to, available to answer any further questions. Question? Hello. Hi. Oh. I, I was just going to ask. I, I mean, I, I know we asked this before about um, about this being large scale versus um, you know the the restricted declarations that are being considered. If if the city council would determine that it would be more appropriate for it to be large scale, would that be within scope? I, do, I don't believe so. Okay, and now, okay, now we'll move on to the post-hearing follow-ups. Uh, you guys received some course additional information about the special Harlem River Waterfront District. We have Oscar Olivier Didier here to answer any questions. No questions? Um, also, uh, for 930 Flushing Avenue, Corin Manning and Sari Flatkin are here from the Brooklyn office to discuss in the additional correspondence that was provided by the applicant regarding the acquisition of the building for use as storage and backup operations by the Office of Emergency Management. No questions? It's okay. Helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. So, also in Brooklyn, we have Warren Street Center for Children, an acquisition of a building for continued use as a daycare center. Amritha Mahesh is here to answer any questions. For Edwin's Place, we have Anthony Grande here to answer any additional questions. Um, also, Tillery and Prince Street rezoning, Anan Admin is available. For Linden Boulevard rezoning, Cora Manning is here to answer questions you might have. 
Um, if not, NYPD property clerk warehouse consolidation. Um, I think someone from Queens might be available. There's 661 8th Avenue signage text amendment. Annie White is here from the Manhattan office. 8449 Broadway, Annie White is also here from the Manhattan office to discuss. If not, then there's also 220 Central Park South, Richard Suarez here from Manhattan office. Coming up, moving on to East Harlem neighborhood rezoning, we have Calvin Brown and Eric Olson um, will be presenting the first of several post-hearing follow-up discussions. Good afternoon, commissioners. So I'm Eric Olson, project manager for the East Harlem rezoning proposal, here with Calvin Brown, project supervisor. And we just wanted to follow up on a few of the recurring issues that we heard at the public hearing on Wednesday, August 23rd. <clears throat> So on the 23rd, we heard a lot from local residents, stakeholders, public officials, and city agencies regarding both the city's proposal and the steering committee's plan. Uh, we heard numerous concerns expressed at the hearing, some of which were rele well, excuse me, relevant to zoning and land use. Others were um, related more to other components of the community's plan. With respect to zoning and land use, though, we heard testimony generally related to the following topics. Uh, density, particularly in areas along Park and Third Avenues, where we propose a higher density than the community's plan. The boundaries of the rezoning, specifically concerns that the city's proposal addresses a smaller area than the steering committee had recommended. Assumptions in the reasonable worst case development scenario related to buildings with six or more residential units. Concerns about existing rent stabilized units and the potential for displacement. And a few concerns about the height and scale of buildings that could result from the city's proposal. So Calvin and I will be addressing each of these issues, um, all the issues you see here on the slide, at follow-up review sessions prior to the anticipated vote date of October 2nd. Today we'll be focusing on the rationale for the boundaries we selected, the assumptions that went into the reasonable worst case development scenario and the environmental impact statement, and how the city is addressing rent stabilized units in the neighborhood. Um, at the next review session on September 18th, we'll be delving more into the height and density related concerns that we heard about at the hearing. So I'll begin by revisiting the discussion about the boundaries of the city's rezoning proposal, and I'll touch more upon our rationale for acting within a more targeted area than what was recommended by the steering committee. So if you remember this slide, we saw a very similar slide in the last presentation. Um, recall the steering committee's plan on the left, where you have recommended areas for upzoning in red, with recommended areas for preservation in yellow. Um, as a reminder, that plan covered a broad geography of the neighborhood uh, with the boundaries of 96th Street to the south, 132nd Street to the north, uh, Fifth Avenue to the west, and the East River to the east. We took a very similar approach when we received the recommendations and began our work really using the steering committee's plan as a foundation. We started with a look at the entire neighborhood, pretty much all of Community District 11, with the exception of Randall's Island, which is similar to the neighborhood plan. We then conducted several analyses of existing land uses, buildings, and zoning under a variety of scenarios. Uh, these rounds of analysis allowed us to hone in on specific areas of opportunity based on rational determinations of where added density would be the most appropriate. Many of these areas had a combination of outdated zoning and real opportunities for zoning actions to result in new housing, jobs, and economic development. Uh, we also identified other areas where higher densities would be less appropriate uh, due to largely or being largely built out and offering fewer opportunities to realize the, shares, the shared goals of this rezoning effort. So the result of that study was the map on the right with the DCP logo. Um, and that shows the areas where we've proposed changes to the existing zoning. So you can see the dotted black line depicting the boundaries of East Harlem on the map on the right, which is the same as the dotted red line on the map on the left. Um, as you've heard and can see on the map, the geography where we're proposing changes is more focused than what the steering committee had recommended. Um, as we mentioned during our, less, our last presentation, uh, this is the result of a detailed and iterative analysis on a lot by lot basis. Our zoning recommendations really target the areas where we think zoning actions would have a meaningful impact on affordable housing production through MIH, the preservation of built neighborhood character, and the creation of space for job generating uses. We think this is a sensitive, responsive, and balanced plan that strongly considers the existing physical context of the neighborhood. So we've gone block by block to look at existing conditions 
and we develop zoning moves that address our shared objectives with the steering committee in a very fine-grained way. So the maps really illustrate that we took a similar corridor-oriented approach to the steering committee's plan, reflecting the spirit of their zoning and land use recommendations. To this point, we felt that the unique conditions of each corridor called for unique zoning approaches on every avenue. We acknowledged that certain areas were more suited to increased density than others, and our proposal directly responds to the results of our detailed analysis of existing conditions. More specifically though, we closely examined the entire neighborhood to determine where mandatory inclusionary housing would make the most sense. We really wanted to ensure that we were acting in areas where new inclusionary affordable housing units um, and the development of those units could be sustained. On the other side of this equation, we made conscious decisions based on sound planning rationale to leave certain geographies out of the rezoning. Particularly below East 104th Street and along First Avenue, we found that the potential benefits of increased density may not be sufficient to justify rezoning action, as these areas just had significantly fewer opportunities to realize the goals of the rezoning. In these areas, we determined that maintaining the existing zoning would be the best way to preserve the existing affordable housing stock. In addition, I want to point out that while we don't think a corridor-oriented approach was appropriate for areas um, east of 2nd Avenue or south of 104th Street, the department is always amenable to considering other opportunities in areas not contiguous to the rezoning boundaries as they're currently drawn. We examine other areas through a different lens, looking at where strategies to preserve the existing built form would be most rational. So now we're talking about the areas in yellow on the map. We looked for areas with an established and consistent physical character or a unique local context where contextual zoning would help ensure that future development was not out of scale with the existing buildings. We found that certain areas were very well suited to this preservation approach, most notably the area north of East 126th Street and west of Park Avenue. So you can see a little yellow area up there. We found that other areas did not have the same level of consistency in the existing built form. And also found areas that were characterized by more newly constructed buildings that were constructed in the last 20 years. Um, thus, we oriented our efforts in the areas where we found that preservation-oriented zoning would be most appropriate. Uh, recall that a wide sw swath of the neighborhood was contextualized back in 2003, and this actually covers a large portion of the neighborhood where preservation districts would be um, best matching to the existing context. We also want to stress that while our zoning and land use proposal looks at a more targeted area, other city agency efforts to respond to the recommendations in the neighborhood plan are not limited to the same geography as the rezoning. Um, investments in education, health, open space, transportation, safety, and other programs or services are spread throughout the neighborhood to reflect the community's recommendations. <coughs> Perhaps most significantly though, affordable housing development and preservation strategies are already underway throughout the entire neighborhood of East Harlem. Our agency partners at HPD are already taking necessary steps to promote the preservation of existing affordable housing units in the area, um, which they discussed in detail at the last review session, as, as well as the public hearing. And now I'll hand it over to Calvin to discuss the two remaining topics. Perhaps it might make sense, since the topics are a bit distinct, to see if there are questions now on this. Yeah, Commissioner Knuckles. The area below 104th Street that the, um, the community plan touts as having more potential than I think the, uh, the department sees. What is the current zoning, uh, predominant zoning for that area now? So it's similar to the rest of the neighborhood, which is primarily R8 or R8A equivalent districts on the major avenues, or at least on Park. Um, I'm sorry, non park on east third. Yeah, east of Lexington, at least that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of it is either R72 or on the mid blocks, um, a contextual R7A or R7B. So you saw no real potential to up zone there, essentially? Is that what you yeah, there were significantly fewer opportunities. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And the one thing that I will note that, that um, was mentioned was that while we didn't we saw a very consistent built form. We didn't see development opportunities. If private applications were to come forward for an upzoning, we would be receptive to it if, if somehow land were assembled into a development site below 104th Street. Yes, Commissioner Dweck. So with that in mind, what would be the downside to um, 
conceding to the community board and the borough president's recommendations to include it. Perhaps in the future, uh, that might be an impetus for a developer or owner to actually try to go for a project instead of going through the EULA process on their own. So again, you know, we, we really didn't think a corridor-oriented approach was appropriate here. And as um, Maurice has pointed out, um, you know, there's a lot of potential to, you know, or we're, we're at least open to potential opportunities um, that may arise in these areas. Um, but we just, you know, given the results of our analysis, we really want to hone in on areas where we thought that, you know, there was really the most potential to realize the goals. And if we, I think there's another point is that we're, one, it's out of scope, so okay. the, the answer is quite simple. The second is, were there to have been proposed an upzoning for those areas where we didn't see the potential? There didn't seem to be a planning rationale for suggesting to the community that there were going to be these new buildings when we saw a very solidly built out neighborhood consistent with the current zoning and we didn't see the opportunities for MIH development. Yes, Commissioner Marie. The goal is really a balance, you know, to, yeah. Yes, Commissioner Efron. I'm not sure it, it falls under this category, but it doesn't fall in, under any other, so I'm just going to go with it. Um, the NYCHA um, uh, commercial overlay rezoning. Does that fall under this category? Because I guess I, I just didn't feel as if um, the land use rationale was clear about that because the NYCHA representatives really didn't have an overall plan. So could you share with us what the land use rationale is? Well, part of that, we wanted to make sure, since we were taking this sort of corridor approach. Which we can speak with. Oh, sorry. Um, part of that is we want, since we were taking a corridor approach, we wanted to make sure that there were opportunities for allowing commercial uses to front on the, uh, those, those sites to, to create the sort of commercial continuity along those, those corridors. Um, there were no plans. You're, you're right, NYCHA doesn't have any immediate plans to develop on those sites, but we didn't want to preclude it in the future. Part of what we were doing is making sure that as this area grows, that there are opportunities for commercial opportunities along those quarters where there currently aren't, and they can't at this at this point. Yeah, I think just also to reiterate some of our goals about really activating the pedestrian environment. Um, you know, when you get to this stretch between 112th and 115th Street, there really aren't many uses that are active out on the street line. So really, our planning rationale was to connect these corridors and sort of activate those areas if, in fact, there was a proposal in the future on these campuses. And this is an approach that has been employed, and you know, there are commercial overlays mapped on other NYCHA properties in, in the area. It sounds incredibly reasonable to me, and seems like a communication gap on, um, that's not a land use uh, response, but uh, one that I really just feel needs to be said. And the other question is why it wasn't, uh, there isn't a commercial overlay on each of the NYCHA properties, since that is a trend. It, it looks like it's only um, on the mid, the mid corridors. That, so there are some commercial overlays on other, uh, um, other areas where you know, it might not be depicted on, on these maps, um, but you right, know, so it may exist that, that do okay. exist today. Right. Yeah. That's good to know too, and also speaks to, I think, a bit of a communication absence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions on this facet? Okay. Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, and thank you, Eric. So I, I want to take a step back and talk about sort of our reasonable worst case scenario assumptions that the approach we took with East Harlem. Um, as the commission may be aware, the department, we adhere to standards and guidelines that are outlined in chapter two of the secret manual whenever we're contemplating any rezoning, whether it's our department neighborhood study or a private applicants. And we need to evaluate it through the lens of what are the possible impacts that this action may have in these areas. 
and they help us to establish our analysis framework for coming up with what we call reasonable assumptions about where we think development is likely to occur within these um, project areas. So in the case of East Harlem, the community, the steering committee presented us with recommendations that contemplated the entire district. So that's where we started our analysis. We looked at the entire district, and as Eric stated, when we went through this sort of process, we came up with a targeted approach that was based on these sort of sound planning uh, principles where we thought that development would likely to occur. And, but there were some neighborhood-related considerations that we, some neighborhood-related factors that we took into consideration. And one of them was the existing built context. So that's what Eric went through in terms of there were areas within East Harlem where there just was not opportunities for developments for advancing our shared goals. Because we share these goals with the steering committee. We want to make sure that there's opportunities for additional housing and commercial development. But there just wasn't those broad opportunities that we can tie back to our sort of goals, our purpose and goals for why we would extend the boundaries in those areas. Um, as well as the recent trends, what was happening, especially along Third Avenue, we saw that there was development occurring. And we already rezoned it in 2003, so was, we considered extending the boundaries to include Third Avenue so they can, uh, so that corridor can be included under mandatory inclusionary housing. So already we're looking at the existing built context, we're looking at neighborhood trends, also known projects. If we knew that our sister agency were contemplating certain projects, these were sites that we would include as part of our analysis to make sure that we can have a very conservative approach to our environmental review process. And one of the other factors we considered as well was previous planning actions. What did the city or the department do in the past? How does it factor into what we're contemplating doing today? So these were sort of the neighborhood-related factors that we considered a part of our analysis that help us come up with our plan and our proposal. And though it may look slightly different than what the community proposed, it's, some, it's a targeted approach based on these sort of principles and guidelines that sort of were the drivers behind the decisions that we made. Um, why we included some sites and did include other sites, when we come up with our soft site criteria, we also take this sort of approach where we're looking at what makes sense. Where do we think development will likely to occur? So there was conversations during the public, I mean, sorry, there was testimony during the public hearing regarding sites that we excluded, um, specifically the rent stabilized units. So when we approach soft sites, we have our general approach, which is we look at vacant sites, sites that are underbuilt, and sites that are not encumbered, meaning that they don't need additional discretionary action to be developed. And we, and they, these are our first scan or screen of the area. And we also look at lots that are at least 5,000 square feet or more. Sometimes we take lots that are less if there are assemblage opportunities. But what we don't include, what we don't think makes sense as part of sort of this um, broad planning rationale to help us come up with the best tar targeted area to focus our efforts are sites like DOE school buildings, rent stabilized buildings, HPD owned or subsidized buildings, police departments, um, si other city owned buildings like the Department of Health, and lots sizes, I mean, sites that have lot sizes that are 800 or 900 square feet. It just doesn't make sense. And this is where we have this sort of um, uh, difference in terms of the methodology between the steering committee and what the city uh, did. So in terms of rent stabilized um, buildings, um, these are buildings that are have six or more units and constructed before 1974. Um, without having data, which is, this is sensitive data to actually have where each of those buildings or those units are mapped, we created a map that showed buildings that are most likely rent stabilized buildings. So these are buildings that older than 1974 and have six to more units. These sites are excluded from our soft site analysis because they are encumbered. Um, landlords are required to 
um, apply to a DHCR in order to demolish these buildings or if they want to go through a process of eviction. Um, so we feel like these are sites that are encumbered and do not need to be a part of the analysis. But once again, if there's known information, whether from a city agency partner or we know that these buildings are being contemplated for development, then we include them as a part of our analysis so we can make sure, once again, that we're having this most conservative approach to our environment, to assessment of what is happening in the area. So in terms of displacement um, of these units that may be potentially vulnerable, what we did early on in the process, once again, we created this map of buildings that are most likely rent-stabilized buildings, and we shared them with our sister agency, HPD, who shared it with the tenant support unit. And what, and as part of what they do is they go out, canvas the blocks, and they use this map to identify buildings where they can make these tenants aware of the services that the city was now, um, the city has to help protect tenants and to know what their rights were. Um, so we feel like with that early state, with that process that took place early on in the, in the process, as well as HPD's housing plan where they are revving up the resources that are available to tenants in terms of their uh, housing ambassadors to help tenants to work through the application process to make sure tenants are aware of the new process that they have that um, that doesn't really take in uh, credit scores or your history in housing court into consideration um, that won't put them at disadvantage during the application process as well as their um, willingness to do a study, a feasibility study for certificate of no harassment. These are in tandem, all these resources are geared towards protecting those tenants in those buildings that may be vulnerable to our actions. So in terms of our step back, when we approached the community, we looked at the entire district. We went through this sort of iterative process to sort of narrow it down to this targeted area where we, where we thought made the most sense to target our efforts. Um, and that's how we came up with the boundaries. That's how we identified the soft sites. And that's uh, basically really the, uh, the end of what I'm going to say at this point. I have the same questions. I was trying to pull out yeah. more, but just, just not <laughs> enough right you now. You reached Steve <laughs> Um Obviously, Calvin has covered the second two. I would yes. emphasize on the reasonable worst case development assumptions. Uh, I'd emphasize something that Calvin noted, which is the emphasis on a methodology that we have in the Seeker manu Manual and the word reasonable. Sites were identified as potentially soft sites where there were active DOE facilities, where there were active NYPD facilities, um, where there were and it, tiny, tiny lots. One could always make assumptions, but we provided a, what we thought was reasonable and fact-based assessment of where the soft sites would be that did not match exactly with the testimony of every person who um, appeared at the public hearing and challenged our reasonable worst case development assumptions. I will make one other, um, comment that struck me from the public hearing, which was extraordinarily um, informative, is um, a tension within the hearing between those who were supporting the community plan and uh, focusing on the relatively minor ways in which the rezoning proposal did not overlap entirely with the plan and those who were opposed um, and took issue with the community plan. And I think as we do our analysis, it's important to listen to both voices, but to recognize that many of the critiques were actually critiques of the community plan by those who said no rezoning whatsoever. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Commissioner, because I just want to mention is that when, the com when we release our boundaries and the steering committee saw the boundaries we were contemplating versus what they um, provided, we sat down with them and that's how we know sort of the sites that they were included in their analysis. And we, we told them that these are not sites that we think you know, development is likely to occur. So that's how we were aware of sort of the scope of what they were looking at versus what we were um, examining. Yes, Commissioner Delos. I, I, I missed three and a half hours of the hearing. I'm looking forward to watching the video uh, over the weekend. Um, but I would, 
I really have to take issue, honestly, with the methodology in Chapter 2 that you outlined. Um, to, to your right to say that there are steps in the process of demolishing rent-stabilized housing, um, but it's just not that hard, right? Um, and so I think to exclude rent-stabilized units as a class of housing um, from the soft site analysis is absolutely flawed. Um, and past rezonings have demonstrated that the analysis was done, the speaker manual was flawed based on what has actually happened. So to continue making that assumption, especially when we know past rezonings, what was assumed and what's actually happened are two different things. So I, I really want to underscore that I think um, they're not encumbered in the way that the department is assuming they're encumbered. Um, and this is coming from you know more than a dozen years of experience on the front lines, um, trying to defend tenants uh, and their rights and to try to defend rent stabilized housing. And while I absolutely appreciate um, all that HPD and the administration is doing to outreach to tenants, um, you know, the buildings, the rent stabilized units that exist today, generally speaking, um, are at unit are at rents that are lower than what new units will come online, even under MIH, even under the ELA program. Um, and so they will serve different people, even if they are another, you know, even if the total number of units is higher um, than what currently exists in the community, they will actually serve a different class of people potentially. Um, so I think it's really important that we look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments? Yes, Commissioner Efron. Um, only because what's come before us was a recent school proposal that ended up being a really tall building with a lot of units in it. Um, uh, I, I imagine that what you're saying is that there was great discretion with the DOE sites and other city service sites, but if you were aware of any plans, they were included. Yes, if, okay. if, if Sorry, yes, yes. But I, I just think it's just a distinction we need to make publicly because we just went through a process with um, a No, no definitely. If, if, exactly if, we, if we were made aware that right. they were de uh, contemplating development on these sites, we would definitely include them. Okay. Yes. Okay, we will come back at our next review session to do any follow-up questions that you might have on the topics that we went through today and then to address the issue of Park um, and Third Avenue's building height and scale. Um, so we also had Sendero Verde East 111th Street. Um, Link in the Manhattan office if you guys have any questions from the public hearing. Um, and self-storage text amendment will be discuss discussed at our next review session or post-hearing follow-up. 